to the June 21st, 2021 Design Review Committee meeting. Uh, the DRC is a subcommittee of historic zoning. The meeting is informal and designed to guide applicants through a process of obtaining a certificate of appropriateness or COA for projects within the city's historic districts in light of the city's historic district design guidelines. The applicant participation in DRC meetings is voluntary but highly recommended. Changes made or suggestions taken by the applicant based on discussions with the DRC are the applicant's choice but DRC makes no representation as to whether any changes or suggestions made during this meeting will be approved by the voting body, which is the Historic Zoning Commission. There are six items on the afternoon's agenda. Item, uh, what is it, six, five is a 10 minute break. When your item is called, please introduce yourself and generally describe your item in about three to five minutes. Please on, focus on the specific points of your project that you want us to discuss. So our first item this afternoon is discussion of an addition at 212 Lewisburg Avenue, Don Burke applicant. This was deferred by the uh, June Historic Zoning Commission. Amanda. Hi everyone. Uh, this is our first uh, filmed meeting for Design Review Committee in this boardroom. So we've changed this setup a little bit. So if you are um, not new to this process, it may feel a little different, but if you could as an applicant when your item's called, come sit at this table to my left. Um, and speak into the microphone, um, we would really appreciate it. Thanks. Wait, follow you? Um, push the button. Do you hold it up? No, you can just push it. Hi, everybody. You got you. Loud. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I printed a couple of prints, but I don't have enough for everybody. So it looks like possibly you could share between the glass, mm -hmm. two, two, and two. We can. Okay. Well, We'll manage, and it's on the screen, right? Yeah. And it's on the screen as well, yeah. Um, from what I understand in the last uh, HCZ meeting, which I was unable to attend, um, there were questions regarding the overall square footage and, um, and how much we wanted to increase the, the, uh, the lots, the, the, uh, the building. And so I wanted to address that by first off giving you a copy of uh, something that, that does show that indeed, yeah, we are looking for uh, technically a 67% increase on the, on the footprint. Um, but I wanted that to make that clear how that was derived at. and it was you know it was it was by subtracting 295 square feet of existing porch that was deemed to be not historic from the original equation and then adding a uh, hundred or adding a thousand thirty eight square feet and when you add the the thousand thirty eight to the 295 that once was previously there that becomes 67% of the smaller footprint than was current, than was actually in the collective memory of the history of the property for a fairly long period of time, just not long enough to be considered uh, historic. So if we were to look at it in perspective, uh, from the perspective, although this is, as I understand it, not the appropriate way to look at it, but if we were to look at it as the existing footprint of the property, the added footprint is only adding 45% to the existing footprint. But because we are subtracting that porch that's in the middle, is, you know, it's a very th thin screen porch, it's a uh, tracery, it's exterior, it's technically exterior space, it's, uh, it's not a heated space. Uh, it's on the ground level, so it doesn't even have a foundation under it. It's just a brick, a brick paved surface, which we're, we're gonna attempt to create something similar to it in memory for the addition. Uh, but um, but it's a pretty it's not inconsequential. I'm sure something a lot of great things happened on that porch. But if we were to try and build around that, we we just couldn't add on to the back of the house at all because there it's smack dab in the middle of the rear of the house. So the second drawing I wanted to um, present you with was an opportunity to look at um, what I think were some quick calculations done of all the neighboring properties surrounding uh, the Binkley's residence. And if we look at the total lot sizes of those, uh, of those properties, and then you look at the footprint of roof coverage of buildings on their site, you see the percentages used of the lot, which is uh, more of a, a zoning kind of concern than it is a historic zoning concern. But I believe that uh, historic also has an allowable ratio of 35% for lots. Is that correct? 
Yes, yes. So, um, so in the case of the property north of the Binkleys, that property is, is using 21% of its footprint for building. South of them using 30, west of them using 30. And the Binkleys, with this addition, this proposed to use a total of only 16.4% overall. So that was the reason for the request to go over the 50% mark because we were using such a smaller percentage, not, not only just uh, using a smaller percentage of the lot itself in footprint, volumetrically we are as well because the second floor is only a uh, portion of that is being made expanded into second level space and uh, most of it is staying down at a, a one story volume where all, of, all three of these houses are all two story volumes around the outside of it. So that was my, you know, that's my explanation for a request to go over by such a large percentage. Okay, Amanda, do you have any more comments on it? Uh, my comments still stand from the last Historic Zoning Commission meeting. Um, the addition is technically 67% of the um, building to remain after the uh, approved demolition, and so it is not consistent with the recommendations of the guidelines. I did ask Mr. Burke to, to make some clarification based on the discussion during the last year, our Historic Zoning Commission meeting, and I do feel like he's clarified that pretty well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, commissioners, comments? Um, Mr. Chair, did you have scaled back the chimney on the back of the house now? And do you know the date on the front portion of the house? Um, the, the date that it was built? Mm -hmm. It was in the 1930s, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. I think it's mid 30s. And, and to clarify, it's not an actual log cabin either. Yeah, it, 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 I it's knew a that. veneer. It's a log veneer, a wood veneer right. on the outside. It's. I, I think it's a really special house. And do I wish that you would get the. You all would choose to get the addition down a bit. I do, but I do feel like it's a large lot and I feel like it's not on a corner, which makes it somewhat less visible. So that was the reason uh, I was getting comfortable with the addition, plus just the quiet character it's, it is now. And I want to say that obviously we don't look lightly at going over the size recommended by the guidelines, but in, in this case, I think you make some very good points, uh, especially the size of the lot and the, in comparison to the neighboring properties um, and the fact that that patio, as you mentioned, or, is, or porch, whatever you refer to, is non-historic. Uh, so it, for those reasons, uh, I would support going above and beyond guidelines anyone else Kathy um, I'd like like to say also too I, I agree with you Lisa on seeing especially this other document with the the site plans of the other houses and I, I also had an opportunity to go to the walk the site when you walk the site it does really give you the impact of how much mass is on this space and um, from some of the other revisions that you made um, in the elevations and the styles and chimney reduction and all I think it's it's really this really helps me a whole lot to see just how well it does not oversize the property and in comparison to the other two properties so thank you for that that's a nice um, piece of technical information to have I share the opinion to my fellow board members. <laughs> this was too yeah. easy. I think this this uh, A zero is very helpful mm -hmm. um, in giving giving a more complete story for us. So okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Good. I would agree. I think the lot the lot size and the lack of visibility from Lewisburg mm -hmm. are the two key ingredients to this, and I would certainly support. I certainly support this. So, and it, you've, you've dealt with the chimney thing, so I think that was a big, yeah. a big issue that was before. Mr. Chair? I, I'd like for us to really deal with that chimney to make sure. I, I think there's been a couple recently that are just too big, and they don't flatter the character of the house. They pull your eye, so. I, uh, I think I 
proposed that we look at materials and finish this all administratively prior to any construction mm -hmm. too. And if the that was, If that would be of interest, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, may I add something? Go ahead. So I did want to note that staff's recommendation from the previous historic zoning commission meeting was to downsize the chimney to be more consistent with a historic mm -hmm. profile and configuration um, the applicant has not brought any revisions to that initial plan so uh, staff's comments will still remain um, and it does sound like from some of the comments that you have made as a DRC today that there is still an expectation for some alterations mm -hmm. to that chimney. Uh, and I'm sure Mr. Burke yes. would bring that detail back to us at the next Historic Zoning <laughs> Commission I, I can, meeting. I can do that. Actually, I, I, I may have had a little misunderstanding. I thought uh, I did send a little narrative along with the last HCZ meeting to describe the, the, the placement of the fireplace and that it was going to be, uh, the two flues were going to be aligned mm -hmm. in, in series from the street to hide them a little better. Um, but outside of that, I don't think I ad addressed the idea of making that mass smaller yet. And if I that's, think is that, that was what in you're referring Amanda's to? comments. Okay. To, to make that mass that's small. Right. Yeah, mass small. I can smaller. see some opportunities for that if mm -hmm. we switch to gas logs with one of the flues mm -hmm. and get it down a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, imp most importantly, we're going to try and match its appearance to the other flue yes. exactly yes. in character yes. and materiality. The other renditions that we saw were pretty, uh, I guess, different. Than yeah, the metal flew us out. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're past that. But yeah. I, Okay. Amanda, well, you got anything else? The applicant has certainly um, taken into account the various comments from the past, and I do really appreciate him um, doing that. Um, and I uh, just wanted to make that comment about the chimney because I could tell there was a little bit of disconnect there. So I'm glad that we're all on the same page and expectations. And no, we appreciate the work of Don and of uh -huh. the owners in, us, in trying yes. to work through this. Thing. Yes, and I thank think you. It's, I think we're on the right track. Great. Hopefully. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Our, our next item is discussion of walkways, walkway alterations, walkway construction at 202 Third Avenue North. Steve Akers, applicant. This was also deferred from the Historic Zoning Commission uh, meeting last week, in June Historic Zoning Commission meeting. And I did provide the Design Review Committee the previous submittal to the Historic Zoning Commission. So that is what I had pulled up for uh, the projection screen today, is what you saw at last week's meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Welcome again. Thanks. Thanks for, oops, sorry, a little too close. <laughs> uh, thanks for seeing us again. Uh, Steve Akers with Integris Architecture, and I have with me Eric Powers uh, with, us, er, with Integris Architecture. He's the architect of record for this particular project. And um, uh, in our last, in the historic commission meeting, uh, we began some discussion uh, so we wanted to come back today and, and hopefully continue that discussion. This, this is about 202 Third Street, um, a house that it's not a historic house, but it's in the uh, it's on Third, which is an important uh, historic zone. And um, in our case, uh, we are presenting a sidewalk um, that is a sloped sidewalk, which actually provides. Uh, accessible ingress and egress from the uh, existing carport to the existing front porch of the house and um, which will give uh, any, anyone that uh, requires accessibility uh, the means to park in an accessible parking spot um, and then get to the main entrance of the what will now be a business uh, so this this doesn't continue as a residence it's uh, it's already approved as a conversion to an office uh, type space. So um, in our last, uh, in, the, in the previous meeting, um, of course we went over some of the recommendations and discussions of uh, zoning uh, historic staff and um, uh, some of the things that we began discussions on are the um, exposure of this sloped sidewalk uh, as it continues down uh, Bridge Street, and that's that's the primary, that the long lateral movement, and it parallels an existing sidewalk, public sidewalk, 
And Chairman, I know you asked a question about uh, could we have used the public sidewalk, yeah. and um, and I don't know if my explanation was 100% there, so I just wanted to make sure it was clear. The And I think you said that it, in your case, you're familiar with that particular sidewalk, that area, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we did actually uh, address that internally, tried to see if we could do that. Matter of fact, we looked in the beginning at a connection to the third street uh, sidewalk, which um, uh, actually is a, would be a, I'll, I'll call it a shorter sidewalk uh, or sloped sidewalk. Um, but the, in, in our discussions with, um, with staff, uh, the, the feeling is that would not be appropriate, less appropriate. Uh, therefore, we, we looked at this, this version that you see before you, which is an extension along bridge. And although it is slightly out of the ordinary in that it does parallel an existing sidewalk, um, the elevation or the, the vertical elevation of that front porch to, <clears throat> to the carport area, if we travel down that, um, well, actually, let me, let me back up. The, the vertical elevation of the front porch to the public sidewalk, which is parallel to it, um, the, the grade actually slopes down. Um, one of the advantages and one of the reasons that we chose this path is because there's some advantage to following the grade, which it slopes generally in the direction that our, that our proposed sidewalk slopes. Uh, but there is, as you can see, some increase in height as you move from the carport to the front door. Um, and then the exposure ultimately is about, it's 17 to 18 inches. Um, it goes down to zero when you get to the carport. Um, so really, the, I think part of the discussion today is that exposure and what, how is that treated? And we wanted to, uh, uh, as, we, as I discussed last time in the Historic Planning Commission, uh, we're proposing that, that that exposure of that concrete side is actually uh, buffered or screened uh, by some uh, permanent, not, not temporary, but permanent landscaping. It would be a low shrub, evergreen uh, landscaping along uh, the sidewalk. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out, we talked, or Steve talked about it at the last meeting, but uh, we have taken the slope on the ramp to a 1 to 20 instead mm -hmm. of the 1 to 12, so it gives us the abilities to not have the vertical handrails, which would be very visually disruptive. And so um, mm -hmm. we've tried to be pretty sensitive to that. We think that that may be married with uh, the appropriate landscaping uh, uh, buffer that runs along the outer face of that is probably the, the best way to, uh, to make the ramp happen there that would be very visually non, non uh, noticeable because um, especially with the landscaping in front, it's going to tuck the ramp, in, if you will, behind that. And you would normally have landscaping along the side of a house anyhow. So it seems like the, the best way to to accommodate the accessibility issue without it being a visual intrusion. So that's the, that's the options that we've looked at. And as Steve pointed out, the, on 3rd Avenue we can get a shorter run, but it, it doesn't fit the other components of what's uh, certainly I think the city's looking for, 3rd being such a main, uh, our, uh, main feed, uh, historical feed, uh, I don't know what the right word for that is, but we know it's an important um, street uh, and, and trying to avoid that, I think, is appropriate to, to look at doing this over on bridge. So. One additional thing I wanted to point out is in, in, in a discussion of the landscaping along paralleling that edge of the sidewalk, uh, we, we did place the edge of the sidewalk, it, it's I think at the most minimal point is 5-1, five, five, one, five, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and then we do have some separation between the face of the house and the inner edge of the sidewalk, and then from the outer edge of the sidewalk to the public sidewalk is five feet, and, and at the greatest point, 510. The only reason I bring that up is there's, there's, there's lots of room uh, to have landscaping along that, uh, that face or that edge of sidewalk and still have grass area, so it, it's, 
it's not terribly foreign. Uh, is, is at least that's our effort in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Amanda. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Steve and Eric, for providing that additional information. Uh, this application was recommended for deferral by staff at the last meeting uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Steve is very much correct in that he contacted me uh, previously and, and talked about a ramp on the Third Avenue um, elevation. This is a corner lot at, at Third Avenue North and then Bridge Street on the long side. And you know, the guidelines do recommend against the placement of, of ramps on um, highly visible elevations. And so I did uh, recommend that other options be explored. Um, the, there was a building permit issued for this property with a wheelchair ramp being installed within the carport located here. Um, and you know, I, I understand there was a building permit issued for this proposal as you see it today. Um, and I had to fail that because that has not been approved by the commission. But the applicant did want to change that uh, configuration because of concerns about the, um, and, and forgive me if I, I misunderstand, uh, mis misremembering, but I do believe it was some concerns about maintenance of a wheelchair ramp in general. And that would have been uh, housed inside the carport. I do think that would probably be the most um, guidelines sensitive option because it doesn't prevent or present a permanent um, ramp on the exterior elevations as visible from the street. Admittedly, this is a very difficult building to to provide accessibility to because of its high visibility on, on both elevations. And there really isn't an entrance on the elevation side where it, it is uh, adjacent to a building where it could help hide some of that uh, yeah, we talked about that. We, we talked about there's no there's no access really. Exactly, and so the the um, we're very sensitive, and we're, and we definitely certainly want to provide some accessible access. It's it's certainly a need for this building. The the parking is uh, for accessible um, parking is is to be located within the carport. So uh, that is the reason why they're they're trying to do the uh, the sidewalk to connect to the front elevation where the accessible entrance is located. If you recall, the Historic Zoning Commission did approve an entrance at this location, but it's by no means accessible. It's not one where somebody could, right. could access. It's not a full size door. So the, um, the accessible entrance can be on the front elevation, or I understand it has been approved to be on the rear. Um, so the, uh, the recommendation of staff at the time was to explore some options that may be less permanent. It's not that you know, staff is opposed to having some sort of a ramp located at this elevation. It's just the very permanent nature of the um, introduction. It could not be reversed easily in the future that I've been able to see without um, causing substantial impact to the, the property. Now, I do understand it's a non-historic property, but it, it is a, a very visible location. So if we could talk about options where or, or just learn more from the applicant about how well this can be removed in the future if the use changes and there is no need for an accessible entrance. Um, that would be very helpful for staff to understand. Thanks. Okay, let me just, let me ask this question. I, I see this solution to this problem being very expensive. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in knowing why the, the access from Third Avenue cannot be accomplished from the city standpoint? Is it because someone can't necessarily guarantee a parking place in that, in that spot? This, this is a, according to the drawing, this is a, a um, on C on the right of way. There's a, there's a parking area and I see it in one of the photographs where somebody is parked right there. Uh, my understanding, and, and I may lean to Barrett for some help, uh, is that accessible parking location does need to be required on the property. Um, okay. And the uh, the location for the ramp, if it were to be on the front of the building, would need to have some sort of connection to the rear. Now, I don't know for certain. I would need to talk to uh, my colleagues in Building and Neighborhood Services. If you can put a ramp on the front, connect it to the public sidewalk, and have that go all the way back to the carport. Um, but my initial discussion with the applicant did not take into account the proposal that you see today. My initial conversation was, can we add a ramp to the front elevation? And my recommendation was no, in, in keeping with the recommendations as a design guideline. Oh, so uh, so this but, solution was one where it tried to tr mitigate some of the concerns about you know, the ramp handrail exposure, which I certainly appreciate the applicants doing. But um, I, I can't say with certainty that 
they can use the public sidewalk to meet their assessable uh, needs. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking this question because I'm trying to help them get something that's right. not as expensive as what I perceive this to be. Right. So if, if they could get something from Third Avenue into the structure, and then once the person is in there, perhaps go out the back um, to get to the parking area. If they could be dropped off in the front and go through the structure in order to uh, be picked up in the back. I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, maybe My I'm being overly practical. Well, I, I, no, I certainly understand your question, and, and Steve and Eric may want to weigh in on this, but my understanding is that to have an access at the rear, they would need to have a ramp or a wheelchair lift, and the wheelchair lift is not the desired option by the applicant, so that uh, to use the rear as an accessible door, they would need to build a ramp, and it would not be able to fit within the confines of the carport because of the slope that it would need it be, to be able to accommodate that. Steve and, and Eric, can you comment on that, please? Yeah, the, um, uh, there, there is not a solution to a, a ramp that could be introduced inside the carport and make that work. I think that was your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there's just not a, because of the run requirements on the ramps, we just, it just takes up too much room. You can't get it in there. So okay. it's, a, it's a physical problem. And then the you know the ramp on Third Avenue, uh, yeah, it's it's shorter, but uh, but then it does pose the question of the handicapped parking space accessibility. Can you use the public sidewalk to route around to the handicapped parking space and so forth? Well, it but is this something that can be pursued through building and neighborhood services outside of us at this juncture? We can certainly work with the applicant directly uh, to explore other options, but ultimately the commission would need to approve an I option. I understand that, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing right now this is the only option. I'm no, there, there are three options as I understand it. Um, there could be a ramp on the Third Avenue side, which is on the left of the screen here. Um, I would leave it to the applicants to explain whether or not that would require a handrail. I'm not sure what the slope requirement would be. I know that the... Um, that the ramp would probably have to jog, like come it, out and then mm -hmm. um, do a switch would. back yeah, in uh, order to make that work. On this side is as you see here, and then there's an option to try to provide some accessible access for the rear, which makes sense with the parking being here. It would either be a wheelchair lift or a ramp that would need to have a switch back as well, and it would take up most of the carport in order to do that. So I'm not sure if that's the most practical given that there needs to be space for the car and access out of the car. Okay, well, let's, I'll let some of the other commissioners chime mm -hmm. in. And one comment uh, on the Third Avenue option, <clears throat> if, you, if you use the one to, 12, a one to 20 slope, then you can obviously not have the handrails up there too, but the, the one to 20 slope would require an L-shaped arrangement, so you'd have to come out, out the back. front and then switch and run along parallel to the sidewalk yeah. until you get to net zero on the elevation. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you go to 1 to 12 on the slope, you may, I, th I think we can get from the house to the public sidewalk, but but at 1 to 12, we would have, have, have rails. Handrail handrails on mm -hmm. one side or both. Both. Okay. So we would have the visual in, in, in or visual disruption, if you will, of the handrail system. Yeah, okay. If you do that. Thank you. All right, Brian? You... I guess I'm trying to understand. So from staff's point of view, is what I'm hearing is if this were a wooden ramp, if it were a ramp that was temporary, could be removed, that there would be no objection to it? Well, it, it's certainly a situation where staff acknowledges that there will be some visibility just by the nature of the placement of the building at an intersection. Um, I do feel strongly that the concrete proposal here is very permanent. Um, it would be, not be easily reversible. Building uses change all the time, and so the point of the design guidelines is to allow for um, growing and changing over time, but not have such permanent alterations to, uh, to sites and buildings in order to accommodate that. So a, a portable ramp or one that could be removed without um, a lot of consequence in the future would be preferred over a ramp that, by nature of being concrete, would be very difficult to remove. Uh, out of the three options that I outlined, the option to do a, a 
a wheelchair lift, of course, is the, the easiest option in meeting the guidelines. Now, I understand there's some concerns about practicality, the cost, maintenance, um, which I can certainly appreciate. Um, the, the next option, doing the ramp off the front, is probably the, the least recommended by the guidelines, just by the nature of this being a front elevation and the fact that the uh, railing would be so visible due to the required slope. The option that is presented here, if a ramp is to be provided, location-wise is probably the most appropriate. However, it's just the way that it's being constructed, it, it has some consequence to the site. Um, so to answer your question, I do think that something wooden might be more appropriate in meeting certain guideline intent as opposed to something so permanent as you see here. Although I can certainly appreciate the applicant's attempt to try to mitigate the, the visibility of it as much as possible. I just think by the very nature of it, it will be difficult to avoid seeing and it will certainly be difficult to remove in the future. Well, Mr. Chair, yeah. does no one besides me, having been in a boot last year, <laughs> and my father was in a wheelchair for 25 years, not see what a journey it would be from the handicapped parking space yeah, yeah. to the door. And when I was looking at it the other night, I mean, I think uh, we have achieved ha uh, handicap accessibility on the front of the buildings on this street, on the coffee shop. We also, uh, on the, the, uh, the uh, Catholic church, on East Main, we're able to achieve it. So just from being sensitive to somebody, your wife's been in a boot, uh, trying to, would you park back there and then try to get all the way to the front, or would you just pull over the best you could and, and, and try to get in the front door if you had a mobility problem? So I, I, I've got to believe that either <clears throat> by maybe making another door on the side and making this shorter or looking at some of the ways it was negotiated at other places that you all could figure it out. I, this is on a corner lot. Um, I, I looked at it. I walked over mm -hmm. there and looked this week, and I just think this is going to be a very... Um, what am I trying to say? I guess like Amanda's saying, permanent and profound, a um, little bit nonsensical way of achieving handicapped accessible for someone who has a mobility problem, just because of the mm -hmm. the length. Yeah, and the the you kind of trade off sometimes the we by going to the 1 to 20 slope it mm -hmm. creates the longer length of course the, the logistics of the front door and right. the parking also creates the logistics here the um the going to the 1 to 20 slope versus the 1 to 12 is much easier to maneuver mm -hmm. uh, because it's a lower slope i have a pet peeve about stairs i, I like six inch risers mm -hmm. on stairs instead of the seven inch because they're yeah. much easier to transition on a six inch riser and if, if you're so I get your mobility accessibility if you've got somebody pushing a wheelchair that mm -hmm. probably does it but that's not mm -hmm. the only type of handicap no, situation yeah, agreed there's all kinds of circumstances mm -hmm. uh, cr crutchers and crutches and mm -hmm. different things that people are using mm -hmm. walkers uh, so all those are all potentials for accessibility um, and as far as the, the permanency of the, the material, I mean, we, if, 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 if it's a concern about material, we can certainly entertain other materials. We can do wood. We can do other things. Um, I think the abilities to remove the wood or remove the concrete are probably is equally easily removed. The concrete, because this is fairly shallow in height, is a little bit more, but not much more than removing a concrete sidewalk. So if you needed to remove it in the future, I don't think we could accommodate that for you. I don't think that would be a problem, but if it's, a, if it's other concerns to the concrete that we need to consider as well, we're glad to do that. And, and like I say, if it was wood or, you know, so we kind of have a couple of conversations, your conversation, Mary, mm -hmm. about, um, that uh, the length, uh, the, length. I mean, the length is the big thing yeah 
it, it looked like I don't have that um, foot, with the I don't have the plan of the inside with me right now. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like when I was looking at it that there was a chance maybe to put a door on the side. Yeah, the problem is if you put a door anywhere mm -hmm. along there, you still have to get to the same, same. vertical height. Yeah, got it, so, got it. Uh, all that does is it, it's going to steepen your yeah. ramps, mm -hmm. and by steepening got your it. ramps, then it then it's going got to eventually it. go to one mm -hmm. to twelve, which makes us have to add the handrails. And and of course, we may not even be able to get to a solution because mm -hmm. you can't exceed the one to twelve. That's mm -hmm. the most we can go, as we know. So, so that's all those things. When you factor all those things together with this particular uh, project, it, it does start to, to reduce our options and solutions of what we can do, but. We certainly do have options in material selections and, and certainly understand that staff has had, is really concerned about the concrete. We certainly can entertain something different. The one thing that we kind of like about the concrete is um, because we're doing this as low profile and if we do the landscaping buffer, then you don't see it too well, but then you also don't get into a problem where uh, long, as time goes by and maintenance happens you know wood you know what happens with wood wood you yep. know slowly mm -hmm. starts to deteriorate and then it, if it doesn't get maintained at the right mm -hmm. cycles and it starts to look bad and you know we don't have that problem with uh, the concrete material or some other type of material like that it does stay nicer and, and looking more consistent mm -hmm. so that's the one thing we like about it but but we want to be accommodating to the right solutions for everybody here so Okay, does anybody have anything else? Uh, only that uh, the, the fact that you mentioned that the vertical handrails would not be needed if you stick with this one, correct? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you stick with this yeah. one, this solution, yeah. with the uh, one to 20. Yeah. That's what the handicap yeah. code allows. Yes. And, and I, I think that's a, that's a big factor from a mm -hmm. historic mm -hmm. guideline perspective mm -hmm. because it's those, hand, those mm -hmm. uh, vertical oh. <laughs> distractions yes. that really uh, take away from the historic building and uh, and and also uh, my understanding is that there's a gap between the the actual building and mm -hmm. the ramp correct mm -hmm. so correct. in removing uh, any concrete ramp of that kind uh, it would just be a question of being able to remove it carefully from yeah. The, the door area. It's, it's not attached uh, except at the door. It's not attached to the building. It would be easily yeah. removed that way. Yeah. And yeah. then finally, I would just say uh, I agree 100%. I've seen some some wooden ramps that that have really gone downhill. The maintenance mm -hmm. issues are serious with that. Yeah, and it's hard for any of us. Uh, you know, uh, obviously we're the designers, but uh, you know the clients, their building, they they have to maintain it, yeah. and we can't put a hammer on them y'all can't it, you know, it's hard for all of us to how do you get somebody to maintain that yeah. correctly sometimes so. but we can't count on landscaping either I know I, 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 you know that's true too that's I agree, so agree. The, these hedges though would have to go is that um, yeah, they would they probably would. come out and get yes. replaced yeah. with new landscaping yes. yes yeah okay I have a question mm -hmm. help me we've heard some reference to the lift concept so yes. help us understand why that's not proposed why I mean and I'd like staff's perspective on that as well as mm -hmm. to preference there or not because it is tucked back in as I see it mm -hmm. and having had folks who have needed these types of things in my own family mm -hmm. as well um, some on a permanent basis I just help me understand why that lift concept doesn't work here especially where it's tucked under a, a protected area mm -hmm. yeah right now the option for the lift would be in the carport area mm -hmm. is, is what we've looked at um, the concern I think the, the client has is that uh, the, the functionality of the, the, the lift where you have to go over, you deal with the mechanics, go into the lift, operate, go up and in, compared to just being able to maneuver along a, a walkway and go in, that it's a, they, I know that they have a preferential to that, but um, the lift also begins to crowd uh, lift or ramp or anything in that carport because it's not real large does tend to crowd the ability to maneuver a car in to get into the handicap space and deal with the lift and so it's kind of a combination of those elements is why that's not the preferred right choice yeah at, at well, as as well as the uh, uh, the the mechanical nature of the lift uh, requires that it's of course maintained which mm -hmm. which the client absolutely would do that 
Um, but there's a there's a uh, a default per, um, permanency is probably not the right word to use for Amanda, but um, but there's a, a default aspect of the slope sidewalk ramp mm -hmm. uh, that it, just in its nature there's there's uh, there's no uh, there's no failure of that accessibility component uh, for someone that wants to come to the business. Okay. Will the lift fit under that carport and provide for the, the parking needed to accommodate it? Yeah. Uh, on paper, we can make it work, yes. And so it's just a matter of the tightness of it, but, but on paper, we technically can make it work. Do you have any drawings that show that and show how tight that is? We we do. Uh, do we have that Not with us, no. I don't think we have it and, on And I don't think so Amanda has that. I can pull the building permit that oh, has good. been approved up okay. if you'd like sure. to see yes. it. There I'd was, be interested in seeing yeah, that you, because that you. there was a revision <laughs> yeah. submitted for, for today's review that I failed because it, it asked for approval for a concept that wasn't approved by this commission yet. But what is approved currently as i understand it is the uh the wheelchair lift um as as initially uh, envisioned by the applicant so if you um just give me just a moment i can pull that up sure Mr. Chair, can i ask a quick question while we're waiting yeah go ahead um you're only providing one handicapped parking spot right mm -hmm. and that's required because of the use of this building mm -hmm. Right. So the function of the building is not servicing, it's not a medical facility no, or anything not. like that. So no. because it is a business, it needs to meet that requirement yes. of one mm -hmm. handicap spot. So it's minimal handicap usability or accessibility, but um, having worked with other accessible municipal buildings and providing that had accessibility up monumental stairs and all where a ramp would be dog legging back and forth left and right the total run of your lamp ramp what is that length the long yeah. length of it is if i'm remembering correctly i think it's 33 feet yeah. i'm trying to read it real quick but um i don't know it's long mm -hmm. so under ada Compliances too. It is a long ramp, and you may have to check and see to clarify whether or not you need a stopping point because mm -hmm. you can only go so many distances mm -hmm. before you pause. Yeah, with we, that said, we have we have thank, those on there. Right? Yeah, okay. thank you. Yes. With that said, also too, the new thing to consider is accessibility for all, um, where it, it's inclusive design, where a long run for say someone with other visual or aging the perspective of it that's a long run without a handrail um, so there are some aspects to consider other areas may have a pause in the middle of it with a bench so it doesn't really look like a ramp per se but like an extended sidewalk with a pausing area for someone who may need a pause from a 30 foot uh, you know Mm -hmm. track down a, mm -hmm. down a pathway even though the slope is very gradual so mm -hmm. um, since it's just one you know it's not like it's a, a facility like a hospital or a mm -hmm. medical clinic where you would need to provide more parking I would really support like to see more information on a lift because mm -hmm. a lift kind of is tucked up underneath there mm -hmm. and um, the other thing is you need to make this identifiable you know someone pulls up they need to know where is my accessible stuff mm -hmm. you know oh do I take the sidewalk or you know mm -hmm. it, it to me it's just not reading as obvious um, mm -hmm. if you've got one parking spot there's a lift I'm done mm -hmm. so I do have the uh, the last uh, rendition that did not presuppose a sidewalk on the screen here so you can see this is the carport area Mm -hmm. um, here is the uh, the location of the parking stall, and then the uh, required striping to allow for one to to get out of the vehicle with enough space to do so. Here's the the wheelchair lift, and then there's some steps that that approach the landing from the uh, other side, where it would enter into the accessible rear so entrance. So, is the striping? It looks to me almost as big as the parking space itself. Yeah. Yes. So help me when you have that's a too tight. Mm -hmm. When you have a single uh, aisle, mm -hmm. um, handicap aisle, it's uh, it's required to be van accessible. Right. Uh, there and which is eight <coughs> eight feet minimum width. 
Yeah, so what I heard correct. was that it was too tight there. Help me understand why that's too tight. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like I say, the, from the client's perspective, he feels like it's too tight. Do you, maybe the I mean, better way to say it. Okay. okay. From so, the design perspective, from, do you all feel like it's too <coughs> tight? Um, you know, the fact that you, the car maneuverability is always a, a, a question because you could have somebody that, that has a little harder maneuvering. Sure. So they can maneuver in and over the stripe area while they're maneuvering. And that, mm -hmm. that is a, a, an advantage to having the stripe area there. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, the carport, when you go look at the carport, it, it, it feels pretty tight. But, but, but that's the, that's yeah. the handicap parking or mm -hmm. the reserve parking, no matter mm -hmm. whether we're doing a lift or a ramp, that's right? Correct. That doesn't that change. Correct. So if that's it's correct. tight yeah. getting in there, it's just tight getting in there from yeah, a driving perspective. It is. Perspective. And then you, you do the only additional encroachment, of course, is the, is the lift itself. Which, which is, doesn't look which like it shown. comes out beyond the stairs, right? It, it, I mean, it, it's tucked in. It's come, it comes out, it does come out beyond the stairs, but uh, oh, the stairs running in this direction, you're saying. Yes, right. the stair yeah, running I mean, in this direction does so, not come out beyond that yeah right so the stairs are tucked up closest mm -hmm. to the house and then the lift behind it that's correct? correct that is correct which, which in this in this case we changed the direction of the stairs and sure. put the lift where mm -hmm. they used to be yeah yeah so then you'd have a new set of stairs coming down mm -hmm. toward the that's car correct. and mm -hmm. then the lift behind it mm -hmm. that looks that does not look onerous to me no it looks more sensible to me yeah it does to me and it's it's a new building that was built before historic zoning and to call attention to, and it's on a corner, and then to call more attention to it, I feel like with that very long piece mm -hmm. of concrete, it, it's hurtful to the historic district. And I think this solution is better. Is there a picture of the garage itself? Yes. Um, there's, there's one that had, I see a car so the car, uh, a car, I didn't know was, if there's another picture Let me. Uh, that shows the full parking area. And there's some open area, open parking area in so there, this too? Is, this is the carport located here. But to the back of that car, isn't that open for parking, a space or two? I, I could pull up the street view if that would be helpful. Yeah, it's actually not. It, it, by the time you would maneuver into the driveway and make the turn, there wouldn't be room. I mean, you could... I would imagine they'll end up parking a car in there, as we know, yeah. but, but, but to meet the re accessible requirements, they probably wouldn't. Okay. Is your access off Bridge Street? It is. Mm -hmm. Everything I hear here sounds like the permit that's been submitted for that seems the most reasonable, mm -hmm. reasonable thing There you to go. And I did um, acknowledge that the, uh, the wheelchair lift could be um, installed without historic zoning approval based on my determination of location and um, sensitivity to, to the building itself. Um, I felt that it didn't need one. So um, the reason that it's before you today is because there was a request to change that, which I can certainly respect. But um, I do think that for all the reasons that were mentioned that the wheelchair lift would be the most sensitive to uh, the the site and setting and, and the most compliant with the design guidelines, which do actually recommend um, consideration of portable ramps or, or wheelchair lifts. Okay, does anybody, I think that's, that's where I would like to see it move. But uh, does anybody have any other comments? Amanda, do you have anything else? I do not, thank you. All right, thank you. So that's that's your guidance. You you y'all would that, like that, this that panel looks, would like to see us go back to the of, lift. Is that, of what, that what I'm we're hearing today, from you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I I do have some information that I can share as far as the question about um, utilizing the public sidewalk. Um, Barrett did go talk to his colleagues. Um, Barrett, would you mind coming up and sharing that? Thank you. Um, in talking with engineering, the main thing is having a 60 by 60 lightning at the top and bottom. So I would probably take the sidewalk out. Okay. Okay. So Barry, well, can can the public sidewalk be used to allow for access within a site? I can't say one hundred percent. Okay. I would need to speak with engineering again. 
but it seems like the direction we've gone now is that the, the lift within that parking, I'll say the, not the garage, but the carport area, is the, it seems to be the most palatable to the group right now. So I, I think that's, that's what I've heard from this group today, so. No, that's, no and that's what we were hearing from you as well. Um, okay. We, we, you know, we've tried to work through a number of options here as to how's the best way to accommodate this uh, from uh, certainly a um, handicap accessibility standpoint, first and I, foremost, and then um, uh, sensitivity to this panel and, and what you guys would like to see us do. So uh, we'll, we'll take that back to our okay. client. All right, good. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very you much. Okay, our, our next one is discussion of signage at 99 East Main Street. Jimmy Wayne Stevens, applicant. Hello, how are you? Hello, good afternoon. Amanda? I am pulling off the submittal. Um, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to, to Mr. Stevens just to uh, quickly want to point out that the location of the building is at First and Main, so it's a new infill uh, multi or mixed use structure. There is a, um, a tenant that has been approved for signage at this location already uh, called Mandu. You may all remember that coming through. This is uh, a second tenant coming in and um, seeking um, similar style uh, or st similar location signage. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Go ahead. And I'm uh, Jimmy <laughs> Stevens. Uh, I've been with Code Wizard LLC. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm a Mr. Stevens, can you push the button? Oh, Just click the yeah. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Check one. There you go. Um, You're in. My name is Jimmy Wayne Stevens uh, with Code Wizard LLC. I'm a building code and accessibility consultant, uh, former plan reviewer for the city of Nashville, and I'd like to begin by saying that. Uh, this is my first time trying to help some folks do some permit shepherding in Franklin, and I found everyone, especially Ms. Rose, to be incredibly helpful. You have a lot more layered process, but people are much more helpful along the way, and I Thank appreciate you. that very Thank much. You. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> With your comments about staff, anyway. I, I thought Maybe not this group, but the... You too so far as well. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I do a lot of permit shepherding in Metro and uh, some folks that I helped in Metro, JC, Salons by JC, asked me to assist them in Franklin. I said, I don't really have a lot of expertise there, but I like to learn. So uh, I'm here to learn and I hope you all be gentle with me. Uh, I think we did get our building permit approved today. And so the signage process has been a little bit more difficult for me to get my head around, but I'm really representing the owner someone else is designing the signage and I so I'm anxious to hear your feedback and to relay that to the to the client okay great so, so to help mr. Stevens a little bit uh, what they're proposing is two different types of signage what you see on the screen here is a wall sign um, in a uh, location similar to what was previously approved on the building and then they'd actually like to do a what we call a, a projecting arm sign underneath the canopy, so uh, inside this area next to the storefront, um, also similar to what was uh, previously approved for the other tenant. The reason I asked for Mr. Stevens to attend design review committee today is to talk a little bit more about the uh, the colors and uh, uh, for both the uh, the proposed projecting arm sign and also for the wall sign here. The guidelines do recommend a darker background and lettering color be used for signage. And so on the projecting arm sign, uh, it could be altered fairly easily um, if amenable to the client where you have uh, not necessarily a black background with white letters, uh, but a darker background with lighter lettering and logo color there. Um, on the wall sign, there isn't as much of the concern about darker background, lighter lettering, as much as the concern about the guidelines that do recommend that colors coordinate with the colors of the building. So I did want the, uh, the client, uh, I'm sorry, the applicant to um, seek some feedback from the design review committee about the, the color of the, uh, the logo here. Um, and just general um, understanding of placement um, with newer buildings, 
it is very important to staff since there is an administrative option for the Historic Zoning Commission to sort of set a precedent for approval before staff uh, feels comfortable approving things administratively. So since there were s some concerns about the, the full, um, the application meeting the full intent of the guidelines, I, I did recommend this come forward. So I do appreciate Mr. Stevens coming today. Okay, thanks. Okay, anything else from you, Mr. Stevens, right now? I'm all, all right. ears. All right. Commissioners? Okay, we, well, We've gone through one location on the, that building. Pardon? I say we've gone through one location on that yeah, building. Yeah, and I was going to ask, uh, have you had a chance to see that, consider it, and look at this in light of that? So I was shown the Mandu submittal, and... Uh, they felt like this worked before is what we want to do again. And I said, well, that's usually a good strategy if it's been approved once. So I'm going to, uh, well, I'm not going to say very much about the submittal at this point. Uh, I had to doctor it a bit to make it look like a submittal. Um, and the intent, intent was to emulate what happened with Mandu. Um, again, my familiarity with, with your signage requirements is very low. Uh, Amanda did share the information about color with me, and other than that, I haven't had any feedback. So I know they have the projection sign in the breezeway and then the face sign on the building. Uh, it did appear to be similar to what was approved for Mandu. So. And I can provide a little bit of background information about the previous submittal and how it is affixed to the building. I believe the intent here is to do the stud mount with spacer as was approved with the previous submittal. So it, you can see that there is a vertical uh, engaged column <laughs> between these two windows. Um, so there is a, about a half an inch of relief from this column to the, the face of the building. So they, um, the option approved previously was to use spacers where the spacers are staggered um, in, in different sizes on this section so that the letters are all the same distance from the building right. overall. Uh, the, uh, Again, the concerns that, that I had as far as re relating to the guidelines was talking through the, the color specifically on this um, particular sign because it does have such high visibility from the street view. And then the coloration here just not meeting the, uh, the recommendations of the guidelines for the, uh, the background versus the foreground. Otherwise, the, uh, the sign package, yes, is very much similar to what was previously approved. And uh, Mr. Stevens did do a, a good job providing information to, to show that. So, so as far as the projecting sign, really the difference is it just needs to be a, a dark background with the lighter letters. Absolutely. And, and that would be, I think that would go through. That's what, right. that's what we did at the other uh, tenant. If that's uh, then, adjusted accordingly, then uh, staff can approve that administratively. Okay, that's good. So they can staff can approve that without it coming back. Then on the projecting sign, if if that meets, if if, if that's the way that uh, your client wants to do it. Fantastic. Not that I want to miss a chance to hang, hang out with you guys again, but um, I have shared the, the this information with the ownership. Okay. They're already looking at it, and I believe they've engaged. Uh, uh, a signage contractor yeah. who's much more familiar with and, and I would think the same something similar to come back to us would be on the on the building front that this the lighter I would think the lighter colored letters and, and I, I think just um, to get something. some clarification from uh, staff and mr. Stevens would the sign that you see on the screen be uh, supported by the historic Zoning Commission as meeting the guidelines with or without the color shown it's really the yellow, right? It's Dan, is that no? no it it's, I think it's the black too. Is it the black as well? That well, that's concerned about the, the lettering previously approved was a color that's very similar to the mortar color, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, that's not a white, a true white. It's it's sort of a you know beigeous beigeous kind of color. Um, here, uh, I don't typically recommend against black lettering because black does tend to go with most of the the building. Um, building applications that I received, um, there is a lot of um, you know, black in this building, a lot of black storefront. Now, does it match the brick? Maybe not as much, but it could be a softer color, uh, similar to the darker hues in the brick, which I think would be uh, very um, 
sensitive to the building. I think the yellow is also one that caused me to question how the commission would perceive it as meeting that guideline. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're, we're talking about here identification of the building. We're not talking about overall advertising because it, it, you're really trying to mark your space. Yes. So, so, but I, th I think what happened with the other tenant, to, I th that turned out pretty well based on what I have seen so far. And that was pretty much the color of that mortar or a real light off or an off white type color for the instead of the black. And I think that gave pretty good, con it gives pretty good contrast. So, I mean, that's just some feedback to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the other yeah. commissioners think. No, I, I would agree. And then, again, we've got a, a primary color here that <laughs> speaks volumes. I, it's, it's part of your logo. I understand that. Um, but in the previous application, uh, similar to this one, they, there was also a primary color that uh, was not acceptable. And again, consistency at this point, based on that first um, approval, is going to be important. And I, I would recommend that when you uh, come back in front of the commission that uh, you, you might even think about a couple of options, option A, option B, uh, but definitely in the, in the color scheme that uh, the chairman recommended. We've worked on this particular building and, and want to be consistent in it because it's a dominant building. It sits right on the street and it, right as you come into town. So we're trying to really be sensitive to that and sure. not have 18 different colors sure. adorning that, that space. So I think I'm hearing you'd like to see something more in the range of the mortar for the black yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. something more muted or earthy maybe. Yeah, with the, yeah, yeah. Some contrast, but maybe a little more muted. That's a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. All right. Anything else from any other commissioners? It might be nice, too, to see where this space is located in the scheme yes. of the whole. Yes. Yeah, yeah. When, you, when it comes back to where it mm -hmm. fits in the whole Definitely. layout of the mm -hmm. complex there. So it is shown here. So it is. It is on the opposite end of the building, um, but it's not the corner. So this is the river over here, mm -hmm. um, crossing from Main Street into Franklin Road. This is closer than halfway to First Avenue. So you can see the, uh, the, the chamfered corner here. So it, it's a storefront located close to halfway where it turns. But we can certainly work with Mr. Stevens and get a photograph so you can see the, the, that full ex, uh, exterior elevation mm -hmm. and where the building falls in relation to that. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. You'll have a good evening. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Okay, we're ready for discussions of alterations, rear deck masonry at 410 Main Street. Josh Elledge. How are you? Good, good. Josh, Josh from Construction Properties. We're working with uh, Julie and Mike Walton at uh, uh, Walton Estate. Walton, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. great. So obviously when Red Pony burnt, they uh, took part of uh, the Walton's place with them. And uh, Julie is my neighbor and, and my client now. Um, so yeah, we're, the deck had to come down. It was burnt um, beyond repair. So. Here's the, the deck previously. The previous deck, so. Right here. Okay. And the plan, the design is to go basically the same, the same deck, but she wants to add a roof to it. So yeah, there we are taking it down. Um, and that shows, the red shows where the parapet wall. So if she wants to add a, a roof, a covered deck, a screened in porch to the, to the on, on the deck surface. And forgive so, me, I'm trying to get to the, uh, the drawing that shows it. it. I think it's in here. Is that correct? The, no, it's a. It's another. It's a different. Uh, there's two know. different. There's a side view and a overview. I'll just pull up the whole thing. Yeah. So that's the that's the overview. Okay. So go. here's okay. the side elevation. I think that's the most helpful for them. Yes. Okay. So. 
So the deck's almost the same, similar color, uh, semi-transparent uh, stain, uh, kind of a medium dark color. Um, deck rail's the same. And then uh, we would <coughs> need to build a, a parapet wall up right above. So the height of the gutter, the eave, is 7 six. So we can't run it down. We have a, have a pitch of, uh, even for a, a metal roof of one inch for every four feet. Um, so if we build a parapet wall, wood parapet wall, that will, so on the red pony side, there's a six foot parapet wall that comes down to a two foot. So we would butt into that and come across. And then we would put the, the framing on top to run it to an eight foot, from a nine foot to an eight foot space for the roof. So to put the roof, the rafters on with the metal roof on top. Okay. And it would be screened in, um, wrapped around the, the 42 inch uh, railing. And metal roofing, you said? Yeah. Metal roofing, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. And uh, I did, I think I sent, did I send you the colors? Yes. Um, so, you know, we, we don't really look at the, the color okay. of the roofing quite as much, but, but Mr. Ellis should say that this would be uh, a metal, I'm sorry, a wood deck, not a metal deck. Um, yeah. The reason it's brought forward, and I, I did want to uh, take an opportunity to publicly thank Mr. Elledge. This has been a, a complicated process. And, and as you can imagine, you know, having a fire um, is pretty traumatic. This situation was a fire for an adjacent owner, which you know, spread to this location. So, so they did lose their deck. Um, and, and they were able to remove that. Mr. Elledge was very early and often engaging with me about you know, the opportunities to make some meaningful alterations to the deck when they put it back, which is certainly um, something to consider and appropriate. Um, with uh, staff's abilities to approve things, I certainly had encouraged them to um, you know, know that you know, if you build it back the way that it was, then there would not be a requirement for an approval uh, other than a building permit. But in this case, because they did want to make some changes, especially in changing this roof line here to um, add a, uh, a cover to the deck that would be um, one that would be meaningful enough where it would drain. You don't want a flat you know, deck on, on, or a flat roof on your deck. Um, it would be something that I encouraged him to bring forward here. So um, to kind of show you the back of the building, um, the, the low parapet they're, they're asking to, to build would be located here um, to, in order to accommodate that slope. So, um, so that's a, how, how tall is that, Mr. Ellis? One foot. Okay. One foot. And we would, um, on the, if you're looking at from the, from the alley at the left, so the parapet would run into the brick parapet that's already there. And uh, we would put a, a scupper through, through, the, through the wooden parapet that we built. It's going to have a TPO. Uh, wrap around it and that'd actually be within the the deck itself um so it would have a scupper on the outside in in the inside the framing of the deck inside the screening of the deck and go straight down to exactly where the gutter is going now the other side would be open into the we're going to replace the seven inch gutter and, and then drain out to the gutter so we would build a, a larger cricket on the back of the deck to to drain it out so the drainage would flow normally so just to make sure everyone understands that, the, the scuppers proposed to allow for water to drain off this roof through this parapet wall and down to uh, the gutter, is that correct? Yeah, well, it actually goes through that little parapet, yes, and, and then actually it'll go straight down. Straight down, yeah. Straight down through the, okay. yep, so it'll follow the same gutter line or the downspout line. And then there will be additional downspout at the front. So where you see that the, yeah, at the front of the, and that will be for the drainage from the middle roof. But the, um, but the drainage would be entirely through the new parapet wall and not through any, cause any, any holes to the existing building, correct? No. That's not correct or it is correct? No, 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 it goes through the, it goes through the, the wall that, we, that we're building. Okay, so it would not go through any historic masonry, just the added masonry. So um, that is the reason I'd asked Mr. Elledge to attend the meeting today, just to, to run this by you to see if it's something that the commission would support. As far as the guidelines go, the, the guidelines do recommend that, that decks be um, simple um, at rear elevations. Um, certainly the deck that was there, um, not this version, unfortunately, um, 
the, the previous version was entirely appropriate. We actually use it in our design guidelines document as an appropriate deck. Um, just adding to it does require an approval. Um, staff can support that. Um, I did want to learn a little bit more about adding a, a low parapet to the existing building. That sounds scary on paper. Um, so I wanted to make sure everyone understood that and uh, could appreciate why the applicant's proposing to do it. I'll say there is a few buildings down that I, there is actually a, a parapet on the on the building as well um, that you can if you walk the alley you can see. But yeah, after when we're done with it, it will it will make the alley much nicer looking than it is now. <laughs> okay. And the only other question I had was the intent for screening. Is that entirely just the second floor, or correct. is it the, just, just, just the second? second? Just okay. the second floor, correct. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, any questions? Well, a question I have on the parapet. So yes, sir. Are you pro proposing a, a brick to add brick to the top of the parapet, or is that a wooden parapet? Wooden parapet. So wooden parapet will take the TPO membrane, wrap it all the way around. Um, is it, there's no really reason to add brick because it's the, the membrane is what's going to keep keep the water from penetrating into the building. So the, the membrane will protect the the present structure from yes. water getting behind that, that membrane. Absolutely. Um, is there a way to achieve the height on the deck by lowering the height, you know, the floor? The floor. Well, no. There, there's electrical and gas lines below that that have been run mm -hmm. so we have to keep it at the height it is um, and also the span that we have to have a certain like 12 inch um, uh, mid spans and, and uh, uh, so basically no because of the, basically because the way the everything's going on the ground now and it's run up through the wall we have to keep it at that height to so you can't drop it where you step can't drop down it. out of the second yeah, floor I, on right that. I I don't know that I would be against this I don't think it's ideal because it hides the character of the building and the character of that building in the back is really good so uh, if that's what you have to do to have it I think I could go along with it I, I would love to think we could um, show our buildings with that add-on because I just think it would look more um, it would let the building shine through to miss Pierce's point could you support the deck like freestanding rather than being attached to the building so you had some kind of a four by four or a column that came up beside the back back of the building it was an open space from the roof rather than having that little parapet wall I can check with building codes. Um, typically when we run like a freestanding unit, it still needs to attach to the building. So you have your ledger board that attaches to the building. So it's still going to, still going to attach to the building at the same spot. We could put the post out two feet, but we'd have to cantilever over. So it's still attaching to the building in the, in the back. So. Well, I could see you still attaching. But yes, oh, but, but Amanda, you want to question comment is, on that? Can we make it Mary higher? Just gave you a high sign. So, so to Mr. Elledge's point, it, it does need to be attached in the sense that it's not considered a, an accessory structure. Right. But Mr. Um, Petty has has indicated there is a way to do that. So, it doesn't. It allows for the the ceiling height of the the enclosed deck to to not require the building to be manipulated so that the deck roof can can land on it does that make sense i think what you're asking i think kind of cross between you could so the roof the gutter line comes out we could build it up higher so the metal wall metal roof is up higher and goes back actually back behind the roof a little bit the, the original roof um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, so just take the drawing you have there and remove the parapet. But you've got, so you have a post probably that's going to be either that's flush against the back wall. Correct. Let's say you had that. And then you, you have your, your floor joists, you know, for your deck. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, if you put another post, and that just extends your post all the way up to hold that top roof. And that's mm -hmm. what I was referring to. It's just an option just thinking about it. Right. 
So it's attached, but it's not requiring the building uh, to have height the to change. That's yes. right. And to Ms. Pierce's point, um, I think what I heard from her is a, is a desire to see something where the roof line actually is lower than the back, the current height of the roof, where it's coming out below the roof. Just the, you know, so it's not the new height mm -hmm. isn't going above the existing structure, mm -hmm. but coming out below. So the height at the back would be higher, and as it slopes down, it'll be right at the same, almost at the same height as the six inches above the actual the front roof would be six inches above where the original building height is. Right. To keep an eight, eight foot height ceiling height so you can stand up in the. What what I was trying to achieve, and it just needs to be. A smidgen, you know, if you could just see that original back height and just get under it, just inches. Yeah. So it, it appears it, that the uh -huh. roof to the to the to the covered porch is actually sitting below the top. And if that were if that were height done, of the back wall. As I, built I as these help. were replaced, it would give so much character to that alley because you would see the historic mm -hmm. yeah. building and they're they've been such stewards of that building as you know right right yeah and the they still the another two feet to the to the right looking mm -hmm. from the back is still theirs um, and then it extends beyond so you're still getting that wall uh, and it's screening so it's not like it's just a, a, a I'm wall. trying to get that's the, vi top the visual back of the building just slightly exposed. So, Mr. Ellis, at the can top, you, can you clarify? You told me that <laughs> this and six feet higher than the existing building. So, does that mean that there's only seven and a half feet between the top of the floor to well, where the existing actually, building height is? There's eight feet from the floor to the bottom of the front joist. So, they're eight feet from there to there. Right. Correct. But how high is That's the, the space between where the floor would land and the top of the existing building? That it's seven, it's eight feet, eight feet to the top of the gutter, seven, six to the bottom of the gutter. Okay, so, so what we're dealing with here is it's seven, six. So they, to be able to have the roof land or start underneath the existing, mm -hmm. and, and keep in mind, everything that's popped up here is not existing. The existing's where this line is. Mm -hmm. It'd have to be lower than seven, six, and then fall. So we would need building code to inform us how low the ceiling can get before it's too low to be occupiable. Right, yeah, or Amanda, if this has burned, seven feet. if this has burned off and it's gone, mm -hmm. I was suggesting that the bottom is very tall. So if you lost your, if you achieved your height by making that a bit shorter, the, I think they've lined it with when you the drive actual, under the carport. Right. Part. And I think that they've lined it with the door on the back that's existing. Got it. They so, can't go any So they lower. can't go any lower. Gotcha. Oh, I thought it was the electrical. I didn't. There's electrical well, yeah, the combination. It's all there. It's the door. It's, it is lined up with the door, and there, but there's yeah, also electrical. Yeah, if, it, if it's the door, I. It is what it is. Right. So, so, so I think that to try to tie the roof underneath existing building wall height would be difficult, potentially, mm -hmm. because you you can only go down the seven feet, mm -hmm. and I think they've got more then um, it looks like a, a foot of fall instead of a six inch fall that would so it, it would need to slope much more significantly mm -hmm. and then require the deck to go further out um, which may be in the right away at that point yeah yeah we don't want the deck to go any further out mm -hmm. than it already is mm -hmm. so it's yeah, it's at 16 feet. It looked in, like in, there was space above the door right. in the so picture. having said all that yeah. are we back to where it's drawn now mm -hmm. yeah that's so, well I've been around the, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, it's great to have this discussion but I want to make sure we're mm -hmm. yes, giving sir. you what you need yeah. yes sir. this is uh, yeah, yeah this is all the discussion mm -hmm. I had with with mm -hmm. my, my yeah. folks and and trying to get it we wanted to drop the floor too mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't working out and okay this was the yeah. 
So you? the so the question now, uh, Mr. Mr. Laster's comments is: Would the the proposal shown be amenable to the commission, or would it be preferable for this to be a semi? freestanding structure where um, there was not a parapet required, but rather um, posts that go up with the roof landing on the post instead of um, building up the existing roof line. Can I add to that? Sure. Okay. So we, yes, that's <laughs> possible. The post would have to come out about 18 inches and would go up and then we'll cantilever back the deck would. So the gutter line is still going to be seven six, so you're going to have a you're going to have a, a gutter, and then you're going to have a roof above it going back over it, back over the soffit. And it'd be so, open, what you're saying. But it be would open be open. But it would still be onto open. the roof. Yeah. You know, and it's hard hard to visualize. You know, actually, what you have, given that building, I mean, having a parapet wall there, I don't I don't know that it that it's it would be that objectionable to me. I'd have to mm -hmm. think about that more. I don't know if you had that space. The only thing to have that space up onto the roof, you know, birds, all kind of things could get into that area. I don't, it might not be a good idea. Well, it would have, yeah, there would need to be some screening that would happen. Would. It, the, the whole idea is to screen it off and we actually screen under the deck as well. And that might not look good. Mm -hmm. So that, so, you know, the, the lesser of two um, options on that <laughs> could be the parapet wall. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see that I have a huge objection to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand coming from the par it, I mean, obviously it will look good, but I built enough of these that it, it'll, it'll, it'll blend in with the, with the structure because there's parapet everywhere except for that, mm -hmm. one, that yeah. one side so of it. So currently the back of the building, the, 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 the brick appears to be painted, is it? Yes. It is painted. So how are you going to finish that? So you're going to do that in wood and then you've got a membrane. So how will that be finished so that it, it looks the, finished? The back's going to, going to get repainted. So it's, it's in horrible shape anyway. It needs to be scraped and painted. It's got about 10 layers of paint on it that's chipping off. Um, and Julie plans on painting that same color as the front, front of the building. But how and are you going to, like on that parapet that's wooden and it's got the holes that come through for the water to go into the gutter, how will that be treated as far as in a finished fashion? So the, the parapet itself, so the runs from the roof to the back to the, to on the, for the main roof side up to the top and it's capped. So we can cap them, put a metal cap on that. And it, so we can put like a, you know, a darker, um, uh, a brown, uh, something similar, same, same color as the roof. And then, uh, then below that would be the brick wall. Mm -hmm. So it would run directly into the brick wall. So whatever, the, you know, the color of the brick is. So, uh, Mr. Elledge, I think to, to help answer Mr. Laster's question, so the parapet will go here, and there's going to be a dark cap on it. What do you see from this side? Will it be TPO, or will it be the wood painted the same color as the brick? No, you will not see any wood. Yeah, it'll be, um, the wood's basically just a structural component. So you'll see the metal cap. you see the metal saying. cap, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And what, what, and it's, what so will the metal be? What, kind, what will it be? An aluminum pre-finish, so it'll be a factory painted finish. Um, I would say those are the things that I would like to see when you do come before the commission. It's kind of a drawing of what that would look like and the color you're proposing for that. But, although we're probably not, but in the metal, and this is actually, in a certain sense, the way you're doing it, it is reversible in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, this is a screened porch, didn't you? Did I hear you say that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Which, it has not been in previous to the fire, right? Correct. It was just, okay. Mm -hmm. And the, this is what it looked like before lot, the fire, but, like this, line. exactly. Before we move on, I, that photograph right there, is that the door in the center between two windows? The lower door on the upper? No, on the, on the mm -hmm. I'm talking about on the ground. That's the one. On the ground, there's a door in the middle, yes. Uh -huh. So why can't that help? back to Ms. Pierce's point, why can't that floor be lowered? Because you have to have the landing align up with the upper level door. Yeah. Why? Why? You why can't, can't you have you stairs? Step down can have and, step. I and I can shoes. check into the utilities above that door or gas lines and they've run mm -hmm. gas lines, they've run all the electrical the utilities have gone and they're running. Yeah, but it, I hear you and there are obviously windows that come up significantly above mm -hmm. that. I guess my point was I thought I thought that what I heard earlier is that you couldn't lower the floor because you were going to interrupt, hit the, the ground floor door, which now looks significantly lower. 
No, no, the, the upper doors, like we could build a step down to the door. Yeah. But that, that was less of an issue as, as actually the utility lines. Yeah, that's, okay. that's what I'm, that's what I was that's going what for. Why I, can't we? I think the step down trumps having to move mm -hmm. the utility lines because mm -hmm. the approach we're taking is not, is looking like, hey, we're historic buildings and we're hidden behind wood structures is how it reads to me. And now that we, an unfortunate opportunity that has to be redone, but um, it would be a chance to change that trend and make this building look historic. I, I think that's something that you can investigate. Yeah. There may be, we'll probably have some more questions, but if you could find out the answer to that sure. and be conclusive. I would not want a step down if it was mine, just from the standpoint of remembering to step down. I have one at home and- <clears throat> But you're, you're, you're much younger than me, Mary. <laughs> I understand, but I'm just saying I, I, that would be my only my concern. Right. But, uh, but I think that's, I mean, it's a legitimate question, and I think just answer that before you come back to the commission so you've at least investigated it. Okay. Okay, so, so to recap, um, some of the comments I, I've heard is that um, a parapet wall could be considered, but it would be more ideal in meeting the intent of the guidelines for some of the, uh, the committee members to have the roof line start slanting underneath the existing roof height rather than building up the roof height to allow it to sit on top of it. Um, and lowering this floor would be ideal in order to allow that roof to sit underneath the existing roof line, correct? I think that meets the Department of Interior's guidelines. I agree. Okay. So I have a, another question on yes, the screening. Sir. So what type of screening material, whether it be? D standard, uh, um, like a light charcoal, charcoal um, just a transparent screen material. Okay. Nylon, metal? Um, I haven't gone over that with Julie yet. So, but yeah, just a, probably a nylon, like a heavier gauge nylon that's not gonna tear easily. It's a typical screen porch material. Okay, anything else we need to move on otherwise? Okay, well, I'll, I'll continue to work with Mr. Elledge. Um, but thank you. I think, do you understand the direction? I do. All right, do. thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm showing on our agenda a 10 minute break, but unless people want the 10 minute break, I want to, I'd like to move on. We've been going an hour and a half. Anybody yeah, need Yeah, I'd it? like to move on. Okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> All right, let's, good. let's go on then. Um, uh, we have discussion of alterations, entrance and awning at 248 2nd Avenue South. Kim Harris. Thank you. All right. Amanda? So, so Mr. Ms. Harris is moving into this location. It's at um, 2nd Avenue. It's an um, addition to a building that fronts South Margin Street. I can pull that up on Street View if that's helpful for you. Please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So let me do that really quickly. It's kind of a unique uh, area here. What was that address again, Mr. Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is where Arbor Antiques used to be. Um, you can see that the building, the historic part of the building, fronts South Margin Street. And it's been added to. We do have a, a nice barber shop in this location currently. And then the ice house here. And then there is a, an addition that fronts Second Avenue. And this area, the two story portion, is the suite where uh, Ms. Harris is moving her uh, electric bike shop. So we're really excited for her. That's a great location. Um, she would like to discuss some alterations to this building just for um, some background. Um, obviously, there is a historic component to this building um, that fronts um, South Margin. Um, even some of this is older and vintage, but this portion of the building with the false front um, is considered non-contributing to the uh, district on the National Register. 
Um, however, the guidelines do recommend that any front facade alterations be considered by the Historic Zoning Commission and that, you know, in the case of non-contributing structures, that alterations do maintain, um, you know, an appropriateness that would be consistent with what you would see um, up and down the street. <coughs> More specifically, that the alterations be in keeping with the character of the surroundings. So I, I'll turn it over to Ms. Harris, who can talk through um, her proposal, which is to, um, to remove the, this window here and add a uh, single bay garage door, um, and then also to add a retractable awning over that area to allow some cover for her uh, merchandise during the day. Ms. Harris? Yes, so the window to the right. Ms. Um, Harris, would you speak into the <coughs> mic, please? Yeah. Yes. Is that better? Uh, that, that's yeah. better. Thank you. Yeah. So the window to the right of the double French doors there, um, I would like to um, put in a, a overhead garage door. It would be a five by seven, so it would be a golf cart size garage door. Um, and just make it easier to get um, the bikes in and out every day. Um, and it would actually kind of look like a window. There's a building that is located on um, – Fourth Avenue next to uh, the produce stand storehouse number nine. So they have this huge picture window, which would be sort of like what the garage door would look like. Um, so um, that's the smallest door that we could put there, but it would, you know, make it um, more accessible for me to move my um, merchandise in and out. Plus, it would be attractive, maybe. A uh, little more attractive than that tiny little window there. Um, and then also I would like to um, install an awning. Currently I do a pop-up tent. Every single day I put up a tent and I would think that an awning there could be very beneficial so I could just um, retract that out um, on a daily basis when it's not windy or stormy or raining or whatever. and and. Um, shade my uh, bikes as they're outside, so. Okay. Uh, Ms. Harris has um, provided some examples here, I think from some websites. Uh, the intent, I believe, and she can clarify, is to um, have the retractable awning cover the, the whole span of the, the facade, not just the, the garage door, is that correct? Um, yes. Um, there is a possibility of maybe just doing it. As it has to be, um, being it's a wide span, it may not be doable to do the whole 24 foot, but if that's the case, then just do the second half over the, um, the garage door out to a certain feet, uh, footage amount. Okay. So the historic district design guidelines would recommend that um, alterations be in keeping with the character of the, the district. This is a, a multi, you know, use sort of area in terms of, as you can see from the street view, we have um, we have businesses, we have uh, residences, and this office residential area. So it, it is a very diverse and, and exciting area. Uh, the recommendation, however, based on the guidelines from staff, would be to um, forego a, a true garage door here. Um, alteration to the facade could be appropriate, given it's not a historic portion of the building. But in lieu of a garage door, perhaps um, consider something similar to a French door style that could allow those doors to be opened wide um, for the merchandise to go in and out. And it still be in keeping with the character of the building itself, but also the district, which you wouldn't um, see on the street, um, you know, garage doors and, and, and you know, the garage door um, on the building that Ms. Harris uh, mentioned was not one that was supported um, in light of the guidelines either. As far as the retractable awning, I do understand the intent um, and do think it could be very practical. However, guidelines recommend that the awning only span over the cover, it, uh, the opening it's serving. So it wouldn't be recommended that it span the whole building or even portions that aren't over a door or a window, it just need to be over the door or window itself. Thank you. Okay, commissioner, comments? I think the, the French door, the large French door that uh, Ms. Rose was referring to is, is a, an attractive option simply because, again, we need to consider what the rest of that block looks like. 
and none of them have anything as what you presented. I'm familiar with the building that you referred to, uh, and 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 that's a standalone building. There, there's nothing around it that would be inconsistent with that look. But here it's different because <laughs> we have such a mix of uh, residential and businesses that have nothing like uh, a garage door. So would a French door, a larger one, be something that, that you might be able to look into? So would there be a double set of French doors then? Yeah, I entry think that's doors what Miss Rose. French doors, and then the other side of French doors. The mm -hmm. space actually was a garage. Mm -hmm. Is that What's what you, <laughs> you were referring to, Miss Rose? So my my recommendation would be to do something similar to what's here, but um, replacing this window. Mm -hmm. So it would allow for two doors to open outward, mm -hmm. um, wide enough so that the merchandise can go in and out. But when they're closed, it it just appears as doors, as opposed to a garage door, which would not be as in keeping um, with the. Um, the appearance of the, the historic residential or commercial buildings. So the, the, let me make sure I understood what you just said. The, the answer is you're saying it would be appropriate if she duplicated what's already there. Yes. At the double door. Yeah, using the same head height um, you know, as the window here and just maybe widening out, just putting this over here. Um, that way, um, it still reads as a, a commercial building, but not a commercial building with an opening that's just not typical to this part of the, the town. So, Ms. Harris, would that work for you? I'm confused. Um, to uh, move the doors or to put no, in another to, set? No, to of... create a second set of doors. Okay. Keep okay. these and then add this over here. Um, it could. Is there a hesitation there from... Yes. On that point, I just want to. Um, I've just never thought of of that. Um, but to, but that would serve a, the same purpose. Is what yes. I, you're trying to yes. achieve. Yes, that, that's what we're trying yes, to sir. work through. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do Actually, those doors get a little bit more width too? With yeah. A pair of three O double doors versus your uh, golf cart with garage door. Mm -hmm. It's true because it's five mm -hmm. seven. Otherwise, and you don't have to deal with what's happening overhead when you retreat <coughs> your yes. garage door into your. That's space. a good point. If it's a traditional type of garage door, you know, it hangs on those frames, and, and that's in your interior space. That could. Are you saying that could work? No. No. Could no. not. It, it, yeah, because it'll go the French in. Door yeah. Yeah. And it adds a nice character to the building. Mm -hmm. It yeah. almost looks well, like the, it's the always garage, been there. The garage door that I was proposing is all glass, so it would look like a huge picture window. I, I understand, but you still got to come, come up, up and over right. to get yes. in, so you yeah. got a structure inside mm -hmm. your building. Building. I just, or I, to I, fold yeah. into. That's. I yeah. think that's what Ms. Worthington mm -hmm. was trying to get right. to. Yeah. And I just, I just don't think that a, I, I'm with you. I know exactly what type door you're talking about I think that they can look great I just don't think that's going to look uh, appropriate from the for the character of the the building in the neighborhood whereas those French doors and you can have them that push out so that it's not like you're having to fight bringing them in with your merchandise mm -hmm. um, yeah okay. I All mean right. and you could even make the existing window a door and you if you wanted more wall space and use the French doors that are there yeah. mm -hmm. as your access mm -hmm. opening. I think there's options. I'd like to hear more about the pop-up, the pop-up tent and, you know, the purpose of that and, you know, because you were trying to replace that with mm -hmm. the awning. Yes. And hear more about, you know, what you do with that. So, um, I, currently I'm located on Fifth Avenue next to the juice mm -hmm. bar. Mm -hmm. And so I do rental sales and uh, tours of Franklin and surrounding areas. Um, I mean, we, we do a 30 mile ride to Leaper's Fork, which is actually our most popular tour. Oh, wow. But, um, so every day I put up a 10 by 10 pop-up tent. Um, I've seen it. To yep, keep the I've bikes shaded because it gets so hot, the seats mm -hmm. burn people, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it just keeps them the cool, you know, and out of the, out of the sun, but, cause I have no other way to do that. Um, so that, that was the purpose of the mm -hmm. awning. So I don't have to, Put that pop-up tent up every day. That, that makes sense. Would a pop-up tent be a codes issue in that location? 
I would need to explore that, but I do want to note that the guidelines that we have for awnings recommend placement over the openings only, and that's primarily because the awnings that you see in historic districts are not retractable as much as fixed on frames. And so um, I do think that I could consider something wider um, in light of the intent of the guidelines if I learned a little bit more about what you see when the awning is retracted, like it's not pulled out. Like what, what do you see on the building? Do you see some sort of a uh, frame? Do you see some sort of a box? Um, if I knew a little bit more about how that looked when it was closed, then I could give a little bit more guidance. What about, what, what would the guidelines say about some type of porch mm -hmm. that would come off? So um, that is um, something we would want to relate to the district itself. I do think that, you know, as, as there are many different types of buildings on the street, we could explore, you know, removing this, this mini shed here and, you know, I guess, you know, extruding that out. I don't know if that's something that that Ms. Harris wants to, to do specifically, but that could be an option. I do think that because it is a non-contributing portion of the building and you know it wouldn't be um, completely out of character with the rest of the building itself, which does have porches, um, that could be something to look into. Well, are, are you saying because this isn't a storefront, you can, I mean, we do have buildings on Main Street with the awning. Sure, but yeah. she wants a retractable awning. She wants to. She wants but a to, permanent. But a permanent retractable mm -hmm. awning, and it wouldn't just go over the window no, or door. No, a permanent go, awning. Right. Could go. Is that what? So the way the guidelines read mm -hmm. is, if you do have something that's a permanent awning, it would only need to go over. It, it can only. It's only recommended to go over the opening of the window or the door. She wants something okay. that expands much more than that, so her equipment can be underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, if the retractable awning is, is if more information is provided about it, I think I could learn a little bit more to see if I could recommend for or against it. But right now, I'd want to learn more about how the building would appear when the awning's closed. Mm -hmm. So with end depth, yes, what we're looking at. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, is it a box that is attached a, to the yeah, building? Yeah, it, you know, it has to be. It has right. to be a box that's box. up against the mm -hmm. building. And I want to know more about what that yeah. looks like because the intent of the guidelines is that you aren't um, – you know, covering areas that aren't, you know, you wouldn't have covered historically. Mm -hmm. um, the intent of awnings usually is to help temper weather. That's what she's wanting mm -hmm. to do here, but it, you know, it's over windows and door openings where, you know, people need protection from the weather. Mm -hmm. So if it, it's a box here and it's it's designed in such a way that you don't, you don't realize that, maybe it blends in with the building, um, I do think that could be a, an appropriate option to help her they, here. They sort of, um, look like a gutter honestly when yeah. right that's, and a good, that's a good analogy yeah. so you know but there there's lots of different types and so i do think mm -hmm. that if Ms. harris could provide we a just little need bit more specifics on that yeah yes. that's yeah. okay and i would like to know uh about the pop-up tent and whether that's permitted yeah in the area okay. but on the awning again on the awning I, th I think for that building i w i wouldn't have any problem with it extending over both of the entrances i mean that mm -hmm. would that, make sense well, only that the it would be inconsistent with I the, the I it, but yeah. from a, Again, from a visual standpoint, mm -hmm. I think it would look better around, oh, yeah. across that whole that expanse than, the, um, than just over that one mm -hmm. door. The, the, awning, the striped green and white awning. That one. Yeah. That mm -hmm. almost simulates to me if you did an extended porch. Mm-hmm. It looks that so similar to the situation. How much coverage did you need, Ms. Harris, for keeping the bikes? Well, I just... Um, Your pop-up tent was like a 10 by 10? My pop-up tent's a 10 by 10, um, but I just thought going across the front of the building and expanding... Uh, I, I mean, I don't know the exact... Um, the expand that those can be. Um, you know, just enough area to at least get those covered. Uh, that's the pat the patio portion there in the front is, um, I think, 24 feet out. Obviously, I wouldn't go 24 feet out to the <laughs> sidewalk, but um, maybe half of that would would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 10 by 10. Um, 
you know, I struggle to get things under that as it is. But um, so, so Miss Harris, there is another entrance over to the left. What I'm seeing of, of those main doors, and I believe when Arbor had it, that was kind of the entrance they used. Do you um, are you renting that space too? No, that space is goes to another tenant. Okay. Um, I only have from where the um, wall slants there. Mm -hmm. and, so it's, yeah. it's really the small front over. Yeah, just that portion. So what I'm hearing from everyone, and unless you're still discussing, I, I just wanted to recap that, you know, the recommendation would be that in lieu of a garage door, um, you know, using something similar to here, you'd actually get a wider span and it wouldn't require so much headroom on the inside, and it would be sympathetic to the character of both the building itself and the, and the street. Um, also, a retractable awning could be considered by the commission, but we'd need more information. We would need um, Ms. Harris to provide information about how wide she wants that to go across the building, like where it would start, where it would end, um, how far out it would go, and what such a retractable awning would look like when it's closed so that we can have a little more sense of how that would affect this particular building when it's not an operable awning. Anything else? The only other thing I would say, those retractable awnings are usually for residential use. Correct. And this is heavy traffic. So if we could find out if there is a durable material, so there is. the day you put it up, it isn't. There's a commercial one. Is there good? Yes. Okay. Okay, so width and depth, and if you could talk to um, your uh, your provider about you know just providing photographs of, of how that would appear when it's closed. Um, there's not a lot of space between the bottom of this shed roof structure and the top of the window header and the door header here. So would that fit? That's that's just kind of the questions mm -hmm. I have. I think if you get with the awning manufacturer that you mm -hmm. would consider. They'll be able to give you little sketches or drawings mm -hmm. or cut sheets on how the product would attach to your building. Yes. And how it would project and if it's motorized or if it's a crank or I actually tried to have that information before this meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're just getting a lot these days. It's all about just wait. It is. Hurry up and wait. Yes, so yes, that's, yes. Yes. As a matter yeah. of fact, if I had the option to go with that garage door. It takes me four months from the date of order to get it. Mm -hmm. I have been waiting three months for my bikes and products currently now, so I get it. But um, it's always hurry up and wait. So I don't have that information, but I'm in the pipeline to, to get that information. That so sounds like even the French, my turn. the French stores might be a quicker option. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And, and Ms. Harris, I can certainly help you if you if you have your awning manufacturer. I, I mean, I'm happy to speak with them and, and relay some of the information we need because I, I know that you'd like to submit an application at the end of this week. So, um, if we could, um, if you want me to help you with that, I certainly am happy to do so. Okay. And I would recommend you know getting getting an estimate or somebody from an awning company to look at this mm -hmm. because they do have to consider slope. Mm -hmm. and and how much you know slope you actually have for that awning and you may not have enough room for a retractable one there I, i'm not certain okay. that's my concern yeah yeah i do have an appointment so good yeah. well, great all right any other questions okay that's it then thank you thank you ma'am thank you, ma thank you, thank you okay we're at the next item new construction at 119 splendor ridge chad glore Good evening, friends. Good evening. Amanda. So this is a new applicant. <laughs> yeah, we've never seen him. Uh -huh. um, Chad, do you want me to pull up what you submitted? Sure, and I also brought I brought some printed copies, too, if, if that's easier for everybody to handle. I thought I saved it here. That's it. Or at least that's okay. the file name. Okay, yeah. So this uh, is the one from today? Yeah, do you guys want to look at these on paper as well? If you've got one. I've got them. We're, we're good. I, I'm, I'm good. good. I would. Okay. Go ahead and get started. Sure. I am bringing to you lot four. Just last week, you approved five and six for me, so we're one more down the line. I'm slowing down. Just one application this month. <laughs> um, this is a, you remember we, um, this is a more typical footprint to most of the, I'll say six out of uh, five of the last six. Uh, with the garage pushed um, 
far to the rear of the lot. Otherwise, it's pretty typical. Um, this is more of a four square type of form. Um, kind of a Victorian flavor of, a, of an American four square. Um, so real simple form with a hip roof and a dormer on the roof. Uh, I was able to get more covered porch on this one than uh, some of the other homes, just kind of shave that off some of the other interior footprints, so happy about that. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything about this one that is particularly um, noteworthy aside from the other things we've looked at along the street. We are getting lower and lower um, in terms of finished floor elevation relative to the road, so I don't have to have handrails on this one. Uh, simplifies um, everything just a little bit. Uh, provided you some uh, contextual view there so you can see five and six and seven uh, next door. And then we haven't designed lot three yet, so there's not much there to look at. And I'll, I'll just let you guys ask me all the questions you want to ask. Yeah, you can see, it's, I'm sorry, I'll tell you about the materials. I've got a, um, a uh, shake, it's like hardy, hardy product. Um, to emulate a cedar shake on the upper upper half of the main mass and then brick below and we'll transition to a lap siding when you get around to the secondary massing. Is is there any shake in the any of the other proposals that you uh, there was some accenting on one of the Tudor homes I think. Mm -hmm. I would I, I I don't know so I'm asking this question. Is shakes on just the top of the four square typical at all? It's definitely not a typical feature for Franklin. So that That's was fine. the only comment I wanted to, well, there were two comments I wanted to make on this proposal. Uh, one, of course, is the lot coverage is more than recommended by um, our guidelines. But the second was just questions about uh, the choice of shake um, for a, a four square with, I guess, I call this a, well, I didn't see that bay there. Um, what sort of, is this a colonial revival? Yeah. Four square? You okay. know, I, 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 would, I could give it some of that. I, I, mean, I called it Victorian, and that's because of some of the window detail. I mean, it's more yeah. a simplified version of that, but it's, it's Victorian sort of era anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree with the man. It's, if you looked in Franklin, the Courtney house is maybe the, yes. the closest thing. Um, but the, there's, it's certainly a regional... I wouldn't call it common, but certainly I've seen it in the region. Uh, there's, in fact, what I was inspired by was a, a house that we built off of Richland Avenue, an historic district there. And there are several, and of course that's Nashville, not Franklin, but um, yeah, there you go. Now that's, yeah, that's got a more Victorian sort of build up to it. Um, that was a federal house that right. had a second that right? story added. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so that was a, that. That tells the story of that mm -hmm. house. Yeah, okay. I think George Harrison did that. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique house. So it would it would be more typical if the the second floor was more uh, was either brick or or, or something uh, sided um, mm -hmm. with a lap. Um, but I, I, I did want to leave that open to the, the commission to discuss. But otherwise, I, I do not have any comments. Okay. Commissioners, comments? The comment I would have is the columns on the front porch. I think if they could be simplified to sit on a shorter brick post because it would just be more typical of that style and you've got the ones going up on the house next door, so. Shorter, uh, yeah, okay, the so brick. this, I've got it maybe yeah. at two feet tall, you think? I, th I think, I mean, I would welcome anybody else's feedback, but I think if those came down and they just sat. Just sat on the porch directly? Or No, or they could sit on a small. It's more like six feet. I think that's fine. You, you know, you look at the one that, the, on, in the grayed out one next door in mm -hmm. some sort of a craftsman deal that they'd be above a, a handrail, they'd be 42 inches high. And I, I drew these in probably at two, excuse me, at two feet. But if you think something a little lower, I have, I'd have no problem with that. Lower than two feet, maybe. So more column? 
more, more pollen, columns. less, mm -hmm. less And plant. then the, um, the little parapet on the top porch roof, does anybody, I just wonder if it were plain, if, uh, you like that part? Yeah, well, it's I, okay. I wanted a little bit more clarification mm -hmm. from the applicant on the, the architectural style intent because it is such a hybrid and, and that's why I, I didn't really feel too compelled to comment on things because I, I wasn't really sure where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, no, I think hybrid is a fair assessment. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you would like me to, maybe we can discuss it in pictures um, because I don't, I don't know that I can label it as a typical stylistic example of anything, but if that's what we need to shoot for, then, I mean, I, I want it to have historic flavor mm -hmm. for sure, um, but I think everything's not gonna be the textbook example of, of style X. Um, so, you know, I think it's an appropriate um, expression of that four square mass, um, with that four square shape, but I mean, uh, if if it's if it's more palatable, if it's simplified a little more, and there's no you know there's no bay window above the front door, I don't have any you know major objections to that other than boy isn't it kind of pretty with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here's another example of a four square. It, it's sort of got more. It, it, it's a little eclectic too. I mean, I could see some um, flourish colonial revival. I mean, you've got the the pedimented entrance, um, <laughs> and you got a like a portico kind of style porch here, but it does have some some decorative flavor with the the windows and um, <laughs> the detailing around. I suppose but, I'd like to interject on this one, <laughs> please. Because before this this house was here, there was a, a beautiful federal house. Yep. So the windows, all the windows, what you see in the fan window and the doors. All of those came from that federal house. They repurposed hmm. it into that new house. Really? Okay, so that's why it feels a little hybrid, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when, hybrid. when I saw Chad's uh, proposal, honestly, I thought of this one in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Um, I think his um, feels a little bit more colonial in some ways than this one does. But, um, Where is um, that house? It's at the corner of 3rd and South Margin. What's right across the street? A really simple version of a four square is right across the street from where I think. Uh, well, one more over. Right here. There you go. Yeah. So that actually, I guess this one looks more like. Yeah. That. So it's we got, we got that plus the bay window, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I've done the shake uh, with the flare above. Now I'll tell you, I don't have any huge objection to do it all to do it in all brick, but I I I purposefully introduced some non masonry veneer to this house because we have a lot of masonry up and down the street. There's one other lap siding house, lot eleven. And um, I, I think it'd be good for us to sprinkle in some non-masonry. Well, I have dangerously been reading this book, The Old Way of Seeing Things. Mm, yes. And it says we do not have to be apologetic for uh, using similar materials repeatedly. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there's, there's something quaint. There, it is quaint uh, to see the shakes and then mm -hmm. the brick and the cant, the way it cants mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. as it makes that transition. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. I would say that it's not emblematic of what you'd see in Franklin. Sure. But I do, I do like it. I do think it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. quaint and nice. Yeah. But if we're trying to make it harmonize with, you know, with neighborhoods that are local, I would, I would consider brick all mm -hmm. brick and not even put lap siding up, up, mm -hmm. above the brick. I, yeah. I think that, that would not be a good choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I would agree with that as well. But it, it's not a make it or break it for me. Okay. And Chad, there would be only one other house with the shake? Uh, the shake is not a major player in any of the houses. Right? It may have some accent pieces on one of the Tudor. two that has a Tudor flavor to it. And I don't remember that for sure. Do you remember? I think it was in the gable, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the gables. Yeah. Just the the yeah. tops of the gables. Because you know how um, Tudor gables, they kind of are halved off. Um, mm -hmm. Like it was just the, the, the pointed part of the gable that had some. You know, we might even be able to see it on it, but probably not. I was going to look on my contact. No, okay, you can't really tell. And I don't remember for sure. This is definitely yeah, this is, mm -hmm. this is a, a major player. 
Mm -hmm. I like the shake. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, you could show uh, Amanda and get her to send it to us the house you were inspired sure. by. Sure. Okay. Anything yeah, else? I like your the brick lentils that you show on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Those look mm -hmm. very nice. And if you were I to do, do the top in brick, that would look good to have Same. those. Mm -hmm. again. I, I, I can't say I'm opposed to the shake. I'm just saying what I think about. Mm -hmm. But okay. I do think it's a quaint. It's a quaint design. Thank you. My only addition, I, I, I respect everything that's been said. I do like uh, that we've been able to pull out a few examples of some homes that have been kind of built over time or mm -hmm. rebuilt. And so that doesn't make me dislike this concept if mm -hmm. it feels a little bit that way. If it has its own story, yeah. even though it's made up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All stories. The story of at some point. So to recap, there, we don't like or dislike. We, we relate things to our guidelines. And the guidelines would recommend that this would probably be a little simplified in order to be more indicative of a typical four square uh, embellished with a, a revival style that you would see in Franklin. Um, but it does sound like some of the folks would be um, open to an interpretation here because it is an infill context. So uh, I don't know if that's enough direction for you or not. Well, and, the, and the columns is the only other thing yes. that Mary <clears throat> mentioned. <clears throat> Okay, Good. that's it then. Chad, okay. thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're ready for the last item discussion of demolition at 1335 Adams Street. <clears throat> Greg, how do you pronounce your last name, Greg? Voges. Voges. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to pull Amanda. up the, uh, the house and street view for everyone to view. <clears throat> Um, I want to thank Mr. Voges. He, he um, <clears throat> called me before um, putting an offer on this property to try to learn more about it. And I was so thankful I had the opportunity to speak with him before he, he made that. Well, I think he'd already made the decision yeah. actually, um, <laughs> that day. Um, he called and, and I missed him like an hour. But uh, I do appreciate you know being able to talk to folks during their due diligence periods so that they, okay, they can be fully um, aware of the <clears throat> implications of the zone in which they are purchasing. So this uh, building is the one that he is proposing to demolish or otherwise alter um, at 1335 Adams Street. For some general reference, um, the Adams Street Historic District ends here at this corner, includes these two homes, and then ends at this alley. The, um, the street here is Meadow Lawn, um, so you can get a sense of, of where it is. It's at the far end of the Adams Street Historic District. Um, and then it continues all the way down to Claiborne here. So it runs roughly between Claiborne Street and then Gist Street. Um, wherever Gist Street is, right here. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Voges would like to discuss demolition of this structure. For some background on this structure, um, I don't have an exact date of construction, but um, I believe he found that it was built in the 1960s. The Adams Street Historic District does not include all of the National Register District. Um, it's only a partial amount um, due to uh, the inability to, to get the whole approved. Um, we do like a majority of our property owners to feel comfortable with historic zoning. And so while I was not here at the time, my understanding is that um, a good half of what is <coughs> recognized on the National Register is within our local district. The National Register District runs almost all the way down to Lewisburg at that <coughs> intersection. So this is at the very end of the district. The district is primarily um, developed to uh, be inclusive of buildings that were built um, in the early 20th century. Um, you have a lot of Victorians, folk Victorians, um, and then there are some infill. Um, that is a later, later vintage from the uh, 50s and 60s, just interspersed in. So you have we have some minimal traditionals and um, some some more vernacular style craftsmen throughout. So um, the building in question is definitely of a later period than what is you know defined as the the impetus for the creation of the Adams Street Historic District. Um, the um, 
the mid-century or um, minimal traditional built in the mid-century uh, period is really common going on down the street and some of these side streets. Um, collectively, those buildings create um, a very distinct character um, for those streets, which is very important. What we find a lot with mid-century homes, and, and I'm not speaking ill of mid-century at all, in fact, I'm very fond of mid-century homes, but um, what you find with mid-century homes is that usually, if they're more vernacular or simple in form, they're more um, historically or architecturally significant in a collection rather than individual buildings. And so Mr. Vo just wanted to, to bring you some um, information that he's gathered, which I sent to you, um, to um, for you to consider when you um, talk about you know the proposal to demolish. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up <coughs> his medal and then turn it over to him. Mr. Voges? I learned from an earlier gentleman, this is a wonderful way to do this, and what a great committee y'all are, even though I didn't know anybody 30 <laughs> days ago. I, uh, I've been driving down Adams Street. I, I live in, Brent, um, in Brentwood, and I'm from Lookout Mountain, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the historical value Every house up there is 200 years old. So, uh, so I've been driving down that road. I just love that road, and and I see this house, and I jump out. It's a brick house. Guys putting for sale by owner. And I buy it right then. Then I call. Somebody said you need to call Amanda. So then I start <laughs> hounding Amanda. So it's a story of my life. I got the cart right in front of my horse right now. So, with that being said, so. As I'm as a, I'm driving back and forth down the street, there's so many newer houses going up and so many remodels going up and it didn't even dawn on me that a brick house right on the corner and there's an alley road that goes right beside it that it, it might be in a historical you know overlay or or but it's not in the national which i understand is a whole nother issue but uh it it's a simple all brick house and then as i as i go in the house and you go down in the basement I mean, it wouldn't even pass code because you walk up the steps and you hit your head on the ceiling. So, I mean, there's so many things with this house. And and to the right of it is a house that's getting ready to, it's got a garden gate sign or something. I think it's getting ready to get torn down. But is I'm, it this I'm, one? Yes, that one. Something's about to happen to it. It, it. it looks uninhabitable right now. So I thought, well, if I'm, I'm right on that line, there's an alley line and there's some kind of drilling company that goes down that road. So I'm thinking there, there just can't be. With all the houses between downtown Franklin and where my house is, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on that you could make my all brick house look a lot more historical than what it is right now. And it's really that simple. To see if y'all would be willing to let me tear that down and then I'd be back in front of you with plans on something that looks a lot older than what it is now. So I can I can add some you know, <clears throat> comment if you'd like. Um, so to, to clarify Mr. Voges' comment, um, the National Register Historic District does extend from roughly Lewisburg down to, to Gist Street, but it, this building is not included in that. It is included in the local district, but this building and the one next to it are not included in the National Register District. So it's not defined as contributing or non-contributing on a national level, it's, it's outside of that. Um, he also uh, had mentioned that, you know, he didn't feel that this is, you know, part of the reason that the district was defined. I, I don't find anything particularly wrong with this house structurally or, or even architecturally from a you know, a professional standpoint, but I would agree that it's not within the period of significance by which that district was established. It's very difficult for me to to say that you know demolition of a structure um, is appropriate when you know there there are a lot of structures like this just adjacent to it, but it's not the reason that that Adam Street Historic District was was created. So. If it would have been cut off at just street, I'd be fine. But it comes <laughs> just across the street and it hops over my place. So. Yeah, and, and I'm sure you're you're not alone. We've yeah. we've listened to a lot of people in your same shoes. Right. Um, 
demolition is not a word that, that we take lightly at all, uh, even for something like this. So um, perhaps it would be helpful to see what you have in mind. You, you say that, uh, or is, have you even considered whether uh, demolition is the only option or you can sort of <coughs> give us something else that can be added to this house or expanded. Well, well one, I'm, I'm in a brick house now. I, I'm, I, I like the older wood structure look than a, than a red brick building. I know Mr. Lester said he likes red brick on the mm -hmm. earlier gentleman, but I'm just, not a, I'm just not a brick person. But I, I just, I love the location. It, it, it would look a lot more historical than what it does now. I know demolition is, is really a bad word. I'm not, I'm not big on demolition. But it, if I tried to remodel it, like I said, when you go downstairs, you go up the stairs to get out the back. You can't get out of the back anywhere on this house. You literally, I took three people in there and all three of them hit their head on this overhang. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's just not laid out real well. Mm -hmm. And then with it being outside the dates that we're trying to, or that y'all are trying to protect, and with the look that you're trying to achieve, it really just doesn't have that, that historical look that, that Franklin's known for. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it just doesn't. Yeah. And it's, it's just one block too far, yeah. or too far in, mm -hmm. or it would be outside the local historic. So before I go get an architect to draw up a bunch of plans and all that, I thought, well, you know, we'll cross this first bridge. Just see if, if the committee would be kind enough to consider a demolition of, of this house. Sure, yeah. And, and my only final comment is that, of course, we have to consider a precedent that we are, would be setting if we did approve the demolition. So with that, I'll let the other commissioners. Well, I took a picture, I don't know if Amanda had it, but just one block or maybe two blocks going back toward town, there's a corner lot. Just, I would call mine a corner lot, even though that's an alleyway. This one the, or on down? It, on, on down a little more. I mean, that whole corner has, I, did, I never saw the house before, so if it's a remodel job, it's it's. It, and that was not in the district. Right. So, so Mr. It's Vegas, not in the historic district. To help. On the corner well, of the blue. My, 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 I guess my point is, you know, you're further out, but so, somebody can get closer to downtown Franklin, which I, I think is one of the most wonderful cities in in the, in the country. Somebody's closer to downtown the the national part, and they they tear it down, or you know, got this humongous house and i'm just talking about another and, and 25 that's, what, that's what we're overly sensitive to yeah, yeah. No, and, because, but and, and let me let me go on. as you yeah, if you go one way. house over on that corner to metalon and then travel down metalon all of those houses were 1950s built mm -hmm. right and and it's going to happen i know but and that's not in the district down the street Right. But right. the one you've bought and the one right next to it happened to be. Right. But um, once they start down that dis road, down that road, and start tearing them down, then they're all going to go, and it, that'll that kind of destroys the community that's been built down Metalon, and that's what I guess there's sensitivity to. At least I. Right. Am. The, also, when you go down Guest Street, which is not in the district and you see some of these big structures that mm -hmm. have been put up there and it's right. destroyed some of the 1955. That's uh, what really concerns me as a member of the commission and I think others too. And there are other streets, Jennings and Stewart have, have similar situations too. And that's, yeah. that's, it, that's the trouble that we have in, in approving demolitions for those houses in the historic district. Right. There's one right there. Um, mm -hmm. it, that's on Gist, and um, I, I mean, I don't. And, and I, I just I want to clarify. Think what the discussion would have been on that had that been in the district. That's why I want to uh, clarify for Mr. Voges. You know, some of these the side streets off of Adams are not in the historic district. So, so to to help frame the discussion, the the guidelines do 
request the, um, information on future action on site if demolition is to be considered. Um, and it's primarily to help protect people from demolishing without understanding the um, the requirements or the guidelines that would apply to any new construction because um, there are you know lot coverage recommendations there are side yard and rear yard setback requirements there's um, you know landscaping surface ratio requirements and so understanding if demolition is would be supported I think it's primarily Mr. Voges um, you know intent for coming here today but I do think that the commission's kind of giving some um, some comment that it would be um, more appropriate to perhaps have some sort of sense of scale and mass of the type of building you would want to replace it with so that it can understand if that would be more consistent with the character of the district as defined than this building is. Is that fair to say? Well, I would want to know, so, you know, what are we opening the door yeah. for? Right. Mm -hmm. I think if you updated the Adam Street Historic District, this house would be considered contributing. I think they might look the way they look now at changing it to, um, <clears throat> you know, telling the story over time because this is getting older. I'm open to considering, you know, the dirty word, <laughs> demolition, <laughs> but I would, I would want to know, um, what type of scale was going on because you're going to all of a sudden make the house next door and the other houses look right. like. Um, so I, well, I, I can tell you that transitional features in the zoning ordinance would be required to be met. This is a short block. So um, I would consider the block from, unless you know, uh, Ms. Dannenfelser interprets it otherwise, would probably be from this alley to meadow line, which would just be these two structures. And so the recommendation of the guidelines would be to cons be consistent, but the, the regulations in the zoning ordinance would say that you can be no more than one half story above the average height on the block face. Is that correct? So that the maximum height of a building or maximum scale of a building, if this were to be demolished, would be one and a half stories. But what oh. is that one and a half stories? I mean, there's right. one and a half stories and there's one and a half oh, stories. Oh, I understand. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to Did, frame that for Mr. Voges. And in that house that I referred to that mm -hmm. you, you, you probably don't like, I, I don't like it, that humongous one. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would put a one-story house on, very simple. It would look like Mayberry. That's, that's all I'm looking for, just to see if, if I come back with those plans, would you consider it for... for Two reasons. One, the current house is just not set up to live in. I'd, I'd like to live in it. It's yeah, just, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't I, have a concussion I, at 60 years old. I'm smiling because we had a situation yes. some time ago where a gentleman wanted to do exactly sim or something similar to what you're describing. Mm -hmm. And he came to us and he said, I just want to tear off this, this, and this yes. so I can figure out what I want to do. And, I, and we'd said, <clears throat> we just can't approve a vision. We got. No, we no, got to no, see something no. concrete, and and that's, so and that's what you're not. You're not saying that, but but still, I think we got to see something, some concepts of what you're talking about before we can and go not much further. By an with. architect, particularly. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. Not, not particularly I, by but, an yeah, architect. But, but something, something, so we can appropriately discuss it. I guess. Yeah. It, I have to say, I don't. I would just say from my point, you're asking for for an opinion. Right. One and I love Clapboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. But, but I have to say that you know, and I look at a house like that one, then I would go, you know, 1960s. I'm I consider myself a preservationist. Not, like, well, how is that historic 1960s? But when you look at those two houses within the context of the neighborhood, you see change over time, mm -hmm. and it adds to the fabric and the character of that neighborhood. That's and as awesome. such, I could never support demolishing that house, no matter what. I don't want you to go to time and expense of some mm -hmm. kind of drawings or mm -hmm. concept. I'm just saying, for my, for so for my opinion, I, I could never support demolishing that house. And yeah, I, and no, I, I'm just one voice of, yeah, on this board. And, and, yeah. and I, I mean, I'm similar to that, 
but I don't have anything else to, without some idea of how you can renovate and add to and do all of that, I think that's a possibility, but just a straight demolition, no, I'm not for that. Yeah, I agree. Well, and when, when I first put it on, I wasn't for that, but when I got inside, I mean, one of the bathrooms is literally the commode, shower, and, and sink is, is, small, is, is as big as this table right here, so that couldn't work. The, the basement is, is really a huge concern just because I, I get a concussion every time I go down there because mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that ever passed code. Um, well, in the but, 1960s, I'm sure the codes were very different. Well, thanks, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they and, had but, <laughs> and, and we really I, I, don't control the inside, so uh, removing walls and things yeah. like that, if it's deemed to be structurally sound by right. the... Uh, codes department can can be done and an addition can be added and if and when mr voges and i initially um, spoke on the day that he put the offer on that on the structure we talked a little bit more about alteration to the structure mm -hmm. as opposed to demolition i think that's something that he he thought about more later um, <coughs> you can see the house here it's probably better from the photographs he provided you know there talking you about you know admittedly this addition was not done very well when it was done mm -hmm. so um, there could be opportunity to to add you know some more appropriate roof structure or to even add footprint to it um, whether it's upstairs or the taking advantage of the the slope on the back of the downstairs but there um, he also taught um, asked about painting the brick um, so there were, there were different you know topics we discussed at the time I do want to strongly state that I do understand that these buildings, there are, there are a lot of these buildings in that area. They just don't happen to fall within that parameter. So um, I do agree that, you know, there are, as a collective whole, these buildings are, are very important. One, um, sacrificed, you know, in, in a location where there might not be as many isn't a negative as much as maybe over time losing them. Does, do we know when that addition was put on? I don't know. Do we know how many square footage is total? 1,600. And how large mm -hmm. is your lot? It's, it's pretty good size. It's pretty I mean, good. It's not, good. not for the house. I just, I, I love back, big backyards, so it, it goes back pretty so good. Half an yeah. acre, quarter of an acre, you think? Uh, it's, it's probably a third of an acre. If I, and, you know, uh, you could look it up later and I'd be totally wrong, but. And I don't know your intent, you know, where you were thinking it's an investment property or actually living there. But, you know, in, in town, I know that, you know, Franklin's a good investment. You yeah. fix that whole house up, maybe do an addition to it. I mean, there's, there's a young couple or an older couple that love to live in that old house. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm, I mean, at this point, when I, when I contacted Amanda, it was probably 24 hours too late. Again, I'm not the <laughs> sharpest. I'm not the sharpest knife this in the drawer. About to look up. So I mean, if y'all if y'all are saying it's totally off the charts, then I'll just close on it and yeah. sell it to somebody and, like what you're yeah. talking about. And, and I'm sorry. I'm, and, I, and I'm I'm not totally for tearing this thing down. Mm -hmm. One, I, after we close, get in there and just feel around and mm -hmm. get get a more feel for it. Mm -hmm. But one is okay. Do I have the option of tearing it down? Is yeah. a main thought to get guidance from y'all. And me. and Mr. Larister, I think put it put it very well. Um, he articulated what would be my feeling as far as interpreting the guidelines, uh, and I I wouldn't be able to support the demolition. And I know that's disappointing for you. I I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did look up the size of the property is 0.28 acres. So say that again, Amanda. Uh, just just above a quarter of an acre in size. Okay. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Mr. Voges. Okay. Consider alteration. Do what? I would hope you would consider alteration. Yeah. I am too. Yeah, I do too. And Mr. Voges did ask me a question about painting, and I, if if you if you don't care to, I would appreciate maybe just elaborating on that a little bit. You know, this is how you see it from the street view, but if I pull up the photographs again, you can see that there was an addition done that that might not have met the intent of the guidelines. Um, it was it obviously predates the the 
establishment of the district. But you can see that the brick aligns um, poorly. Um, if Mr. Voges has questions about you know specific alterations, would you mind speaking to that a little bit? Do you have any? Yeah, uh, two things. One would be to paint the brick, but it would be in some kind of, I've seen several different, not just paint it white, uh, but do something that makes it look older, not, not just a fresh paint, fresh thing of paint. But two, the, the carport over on the right side, I would, I would highly suggest that being taken away. I'm just not, I mean, that just kind of, if you go under it, it's, it's not laid out very well. There's, uh, there's, there's a wooden deck behind that car that you see in the carport. It's just, it's, it's just not a very functional area, but I don't know what Franklin would require for some kind of change in the, the right side of the house if I did decide to go with a remodel. Um, if I go down the remodel, I'll just have to get, some, get, some, get somebody to draw something up and bring it back before the committee. Mm -hmm. Well, I can go ahead and state without, uh, you know, talking too much off topic um, that staff would support, you know, if you wanted to remove the wood deck, uh, you know, as a, a later appendage, staff could certainly support yeah. the removal of the deck. Uh, I do think we'd have to learn more about what you might want to replace it with. Right. <clears throat> what, what about the addition, Amanda, from your standpoint? I don't have any problem with the carport moving away. Um, the addition, you mean specifically altering it or pa through paint? No, removing. Um, if this this part, as you see it here? No, no, that's the house. You need to go on the other side. That's part of the house. On that I, side. Understand, I understand that. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure I understood what Mr. Roberts I, I was asking. Oh, this, the carport? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I can support I, removal yeah, of the carport. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking where that brick meets the original house, the, that side elevation you had. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there, where those two windows are and the air conditioning and the door. If that is that, that's not part of the original house, I don't think. No, it's not. Yeah. If if Mr. Vo just wanted to remove that, staff could support it. Yes. Well, that's but, what. That's yeah. So mm -hmm. that's we're we're beginning to get somewhere. I mm -hmm. think if that went away, if that back. And I, I could support. I mean, I think it would be preferred that the addition would be clapboard. Yeah, but if, but what about? Tearing it off, Mary. Would you have any? I would. I would support that. Yeah. So, and then so you could actually put a sec. We are making progress. Here. Say, I, yeah. If, if I take, if I took that back section, which would get rid of that basement thing, I've got to get rid of that basement. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you wouldn't I, hit your head. If I took that out, and I could put some kind of bigger porch, except for four feet, if I could put a bigger porch where I could put some rocking chairs on it, <laughs> yeah. we 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 might be able to get somewhere because I can change the inside. So, you know, typically that, see, this, Mr. Voges, this proceeds when the district was created and the design guidelines were established. The Historic Zoning Commission, as, as its guidelines are written now, would not have supported this addition. Um, and yeah. st staff wouldn't have. So what Ms. Pierce is stating is if you wanted to remove this, you know, and go back with an addition that is um, with lap siding, that could be supported if it met all the other applicable guidelines for size and, and how you know we want it to still read as an addition to the building, like with an inset or offset. You can see this abuts the the corner yeah. quite evenly um, to its detriment. You know, if that were just mm -hmm. inset a few inches, I think it would read as a, a much better uh, or more successful addition, but um, that would just be some, I wanted to bring this up because I, I want Mr. Bo just to kind of get an idea from the commission of, you know, there, there's more, um, perhaps more um, palatable in light of the guidelines alterations that could be pursued here as opposed to demolition. Uh, a house that I'm thinking of is at the corner of Franklin Road and Winslow, where it was a small cottage and it was wood, so I'm not suggesting this brick go away, but just the um, negotiation they did on that addition to get what they wanted is, um, it, it's not what you would do, but I think it's at well, least. Well, that's that white cut uh, right there at the factory. At the, an at, inspiration, the, uh -huh. Yes, that, yes. That, that turned out very well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to see right there, but um, Mr. Voges, yes, there is, the there is an addition that's here. Now it is siding on siding, but um, I do think it's worthwhile. It's but almost right across the street from the factory. Brick, 
Yeah. If you did siding on brick, uh, I think the stature is very similar. Mm -hmm. that, 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 was, mm -hmm. that was really, that turned out really nice. Mm -hmm. I read it somewhere, but according to the, the regulations, I could go for, you know, remove that part, and I could still go further back because yes. that that lot mm -hmm. is really deep. I, yes. just, mm -hmm. I just can't go wider. Is it, did I read that yeah, right? That, 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 right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can well, go they, back. Could you? Yeah. Right. You got and plenty of room. and that that is true. The regulations. There are design guidelines that this commission considers, and in, in addition to that, um, as far as you know, the footprint of the addition, the placement of the addition, the design of the roof line, and tying to the um, existing structure. So. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that the addition can go so far, you know, forever. Forever no, no. back. <laughs> no, no. But I don't, I don't want it that much bigger. Yeah. I just, yeah. Can I yeah. go outside the but, back of the gad lines or right. where yeah. the current structure? I do mm -hmm. think that that's something we would be open to talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, I hate to say yes, yes without seeing something, all, but I do think that the commission would be open to so it. So all is not lost here. Right. <laughs> I, I, I think that. it was brilliant <laughs> that you got to buy something in this market on <laughs> Adams Street, I'm stunned. I'm the dumbest resident y'all will have if I no. move here. I drive down the road, some guy's putting a for sale sign and get out and buy it. Then I call Amanda. <laughs> well, I will tell you what my mother always told me, that when life hands you a lemon, start making lemonade. I'm tired of making lemonade. <laughs> so you start squeezing, get some sugar. I got you'll, a whole basement full fun. of lemonade, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so, so I, I do hear that demolition would likely be discouraged in this particular full property. demolition, full full, full, full demolition, demolition, but yeah. partial demolition through removal of the carport deck and, and the um, addition that's very clearly um, on the back, um, in, in replacement of you know something similar in footprint, slightly larger perhaps could be considered. Um, I would encourage you, Mr. Voges, if that's something that you would want to to consider, just continue working with me, and we could perhaps have some elevations. Very, they don't have to be through an architect. Maybe just some, you know, inspirational photos or you know yeah. something drawn to kind of get a sense of scale and, and size that you could bring back to this meeting again and talk okay. about um, plan, get some feedback. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Just so would you would see the, how much we'll work right. Work well, would the committee let me do something with that porch? I don't like that porch. It's, it's too yeah, small. Yeah, you, you just figure out what the do something is mm -hmm. and, and just some <laughs> concepts and then bring us back okay. something at another one of these where we discuss it. It's not yeah. a voting, make a final decision type right. thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's he's trying to, to finalize the sale or not, I think is what yeah. it is. Well, I, I, it's non-refundable, so I'm done. So I, <laughs> just I told y'all when we started this, I put the card in front of my horse. I just needed to get out of my way a little bit. And you ask about paintings. I think that, that should be addressed, too. Um, the guidelines recommend against it. And, you know, I've been on the board now three years, and in that period of time, I don't know of a time the board has voted to allow painting of a non-painted brick building. Uh, so, I mean, you can always ask, but I'm just saying that's been the, the precedent the board has set. I do think it would be contrary to the character of the building type that the commission's seeking to protect in this area, um, because that is a very um, character-defining feature of these mid-century mid minimal traditional style homes. Um, in lieu of painting, I do think that there are a lot of opportunities to, to you know, play with shutters and you know roof color and, and things like that that could to bring more visual interest um, as, as you would like to see it, to, to bring more of your own personal uh, personality to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Vogt. It's so nice to meet you. All right. Anything else we need to deal with? Just a reminder, we've got Wednesday afternoon site visit at, what time is it, 3.30? The uh, site visit is at 3.30. It'll be at 334 Franklin Road, which is Wyatt Hall. Wyatt Hall. Um, I will send you information via email tomorrow morning um, on the discussions and the applicant's proposal moving forward. I don't know that that's something that they are seeking to move forward with for the July meeting, but it is something that they're they're seeking to move forward with fairly quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll give you that background information. And again, if you have any questions when you receive it, feel free to, to contact is me. Is there any way or is notification a problem to add the one we missed today 
on to that since we'll be? We cannot. We do need to uh, okay. re-advertise that. The soonest I could do that would be next week if I chose a date right at this very moment, which I don't think we can do. No. So it would be, you know, maybe late June, early July. Um, I have to kind of go with the flow when it comes to some of these. I don't mm -hmm. take canceling meetings lightly. I mm -hmm. know that your time and, and your um, your scheduling is very important and invaluable to me. I don't want to, to waste your time. But um, being out in the open field with no cover, with the chance of a storm, just wasn't yeah. something yeah. I felt yeah. comfortable I, I, putting you no, all that through. Was right. That was right. <laughs> all right. On this visit Wednesday, this site visit Wednesday, is the information you're sending us tomorrow a little bit of history of the evolution of how that's developed? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. All right. All right. I, I think, think that's it. We are adjourned then. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. <laughs>